Hi, Brad. I think we can get started whenever you're ready. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so, hello, everyone. I want to welcome all of you to today's BASC session entitled Advancing Subseasonal to Seasonal Forecasting. I'm Brad Coleman, an atmospheric scientist and a member of BASC. I'm also currently serving as president of the American Meteorological Society. I had the opportunity to serve on the team that designed this session, and we had a lot of fun putting it together. And we hope that we'll have a fascinating discussion today on recent and future gains and challenges in the S2S arena. We owe a debt of gratitude to the speakers and panelists who have agreed to join us today. And I wanna take time to thank all of them. And I also wanted to thank the excellent National Academy staff. If we move to the next slide, please. BASC is the Board of Atmospheric Sciences and Climate. It is part of the National Academies of Sciences. It is one of 11 boards within the Division of Earth and Life Studies. And at BASC, we have a very diverse portfolio across weather, water, climate, and earth system science in general. When we look at that diverse portfolio, several particularly relevant interests include the three here, uh, advancing relevant methodologies and technologies, enhancing structure and operations to optimize all components of the observing and forecasting system, and maintaining a focus of the scientific aspects of our mission towards societal impacts. The topic of S2S is not new to BASC. Most recently in 2016, a consensus study was completed that provided a rather comprehensive research agenda in this area. Among, on top, so overarching that research agenda, a very notable goal or challenge from the 2016 report is shown in bold. Getting S2S forecasts to be as widely used within 10 years as weather forecasts. Next slide, please. It's been almost 10 years since the report. So almost that 10 years has almost gone by. And we certainly feel it is time to reflect on the report and think about whether we are due another National Academies activity or where we or whether we should at BASC help support in other ways the S2S progress. These three bullets of interest uh, here are really what we saw is, is sort of primary. Oh, my, my slide. Okay. Uh, what we wanted to focus, focus on in today's S2S session. First, considering how S2S forecasts be more useful. Uh, this is this was is important across Basque in general, and particularly it was important in the study you see here, the 2016 study, in paying attention to both the scientific side but also the user side, and how can we make that information more relevant uh, to the the broader community and society in general. Since the 2016 report, certainly a lot more attention and energy and excitement is now set on data-driven methodologies. So we wanna really focus on that aspect of it as well. And then finally, you know, in that sort of seven to eight years since the study, typical trend in weather forecast improvements in skill, we've probably added one day in skill in the weather forecasts. So how are we doing on the S2S side? And also how do we look, you know, when we look at these two aspects, seasonal, sub-seasonal forecasting and weather forecasting, they're beginning to blur and blend in the middle and how can we address that? And we have a session or a panel on that as well. If we can now move one more slide here, I believe. Uh, this is what the, the agenda looks like very quickly because we'll be introducing each panel separately as we move through the three plus hour agenda. 
After my welcome, we are very fortunate to have Andy Brown, the Director of Research at the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting, and also, very importantly to point out, he was a committee member for the 2016 report. So he'll be setting that stage for us, and I'll talk a little bit about his topics, but you know, an excellent way to start out the, the session this afternoon. And then we'll move into the session on uncertainty. Uh, Mary Glacken will be the moderator there. When you start talking again, scientific, you know, uncertainty is so critical as we set our scientific agendas, but also so important when we start looking at value and societal impacts. How do we manage, how do we reduce uncertainty and how we better understand uncertainty so that we can bring the right value, the right products, the right terms to the decision makers and stakeholders. We'll have a short break at 2.50 for 10 minutes and then moving to the next slide. At that point, we'll move on to the, a session moderated by Amy McGovern that will be on the emerging role of data-driven methods for us to ask the AI, the ML, DL aspects, and what is the promise, what are the challenges uh, that we should see there. And then we'll take one more break, and then we'll close out with a third session, which is really not only bringing sort of the, the afternoon to a close, but really talking about how do we bring together climate and weather for S2S forecasting. And we have an excellent panel there as well. And I'll be moderating that. And good, good opportunity for discussion throughout. Uh, we'll be having sort of short uh, lightning talks with a lot of operation, a lot of opportunity and QA with the audience. So I think now we go to the next slide, please. A few logistics. This is totally virtual. So all of you are out there uh, two-dimensionally. And we ask, first off, please keep your microphones muted. Uh, we know there are several hundred people who registered for this, and we wanna make sure that we keep any interruptions to a minimum. In each case, for each panel this afternoon, the speakers will go first. They'll share their thoughts. In some cases, they'll have slides and they'll be sharing their own slides. So there'll be some transitions in there. And then we'll open it up for discussion and Q&A and moderated by the BASC members I pointed out. There are a few ways that you can interact with us during this process. First, if you have a question during the presentation, go ahead and type it into the Zoom chat window. You can type in there, all of you should have access to that. And we have staff who will be monitoring that and we'll be sorting and combining and, and looking at how we can best handle those questions. And then, once we get into the Q&A part, where we're actually listening to the, the panelists answer and respond to questions, we, you can use the raise your hand feature. And again, we'll be, we have staff looking at this. I do wanna point out that, again, it's a large audience, several hundred of you. Uh, we will be prioritizing Basque board, you know, Basque members uh, in general over others, but we hope to get to everyone. And again, if you, see lots of raised hands, make sure you get your question in chat and we can try to get to there as well. Final logistical issue is if you have any concerns or if you can't raise a hand or enter, at least send an email to Rita Gaskin, Rita Gaskins at rgaskins at nas.edu. Okay, and now I think we're ready for the last slide here, which is going to be, oh, I'm there for here. A National Academies of Sciences uh, is committed to principles of diversity, integrity, civility, and respect in all of our activities. And it's important that all participate, all participants participate fully in, in this with us. Uh, we want to make sure this atmosphere is one that's free of harassment, discrimination on all any identifying base factors. Uh, you can see several references there as well. Next slide, please. So without further ado, let's move into it. Again, I mentioned we're very fortunate to have Andy joining us from the UK, from the European Center. Again, a past panelist. He is really going to, we wanted to have, take this first time to do a little level set. Maybe some terminology, you know, what do we mean when we talk about S2S forecasts? What, what did they mean then versus what we're talking about now as this landscape has changed? Uh, Andy will also be giving us an overview of the 2016 report from the eyes of someone who was there and now has been actively involved in this process for the last seven or so years. 
and then reflecting on several questions that we ask him to look at as far as we move ahead, really setting stage for the following few sessions. So I think that Andy, uh, if you're ready, you can go ahead and start sharing your slides and excited to get it going. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think my shared slides are going to be shared for me. I think that's the plan. <laughs> Okay. No, thanks very much. And th thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. As Brad said, I'm Director of Research at ECNWF, although s six years ago when, when we were doing this report, I was then the Director of Science at the UK Met Office. So I've changed hats in the meantime. Can I have the next slide, please? So, so as Brad said, I was asked just to give a sort of reflections on what we said in the report. So obviously the first thing I had to do was a bit of revision to try and remember what we said in the said in the report <laughs> but if you have next slide please and that's just yeah a, a list of the culpable the sort of 15 or so of us sort of mainly from the US but then hi Lynn from Environment Canada and me from the other side side of the Atlantic and we had yeah many meetings and wide engagement with very many people beyond the committee have next slide please so just as a step back, as Brad said, I'm sure this is familiar to, to most people, but there, there are different definitions of where subseasonal starts and where seasonal ends. But for the purposes of this report, we were taking subseasonal for sort of two weeks to 12 week forecasts and seasonal, the, the three months out to a year timescale. Yeah, you, you can argue about the exact lengths, but I think that the scientific issues and challenges we were covering are sort of not sensitive to that finer detail. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I, th I think Brad said this, I noticed we, we came up with the rather ambitious, sort of maybe aspirational vision <laughs> that S2S forecast will be as widely used a decade from now as where the forecasts are today. I, I don't think I'm going to try and claim we got there and maybe it's never really realistic, but I think really the sentiment behind that is that there's already huge value there's the potential for a lot more value. And as a community of, of scientists and users, we wanted to sort of push the research agenda that's gonna get us as far as we can in that direction. So go to the next slide, please. Yes, so this was out of the slides shown when the, the, the report was presented, when we completed it. And there were sort of four broad headings. May, if you just click on one time, please. Oh, well, the sort of the sort of the blue area there. So three of the headings increase S2S forecast skill, improve prediction of disruptive events, and include more Earth system components. I guess th those all really come under the category of we want more accurate forecasts. We want more accurate forecasts, particularly of disruptive and major events, and including more Earth system components, if you like, is a, is a tactic either to make forecasts better or to be able to give subseasonal forecasts of extra components, hydrology or sea ice. So all di different types of you know, bet better forecasts. And if you could click on again. So the other theme though, this wasn't just, you know, it's not just a science push that's needed. It's, you know, th these forecasts ne need to be useful to somebody. So, you know, various recommendations un which I sort of lumped under sort of used and useful forecasts. So a science end, but very much an application end of the research agenda as well. Of the next slide, please. So there were 16 detailed recommendations. You can see, obviously see them yourselves if you get, get the report. I, I did think of listing them all, but it, it was going to get a, a bit dry. So I just tried to sort of give a flavor of the sorts of areas these recommendations were covered, covering. I mean, and the first two, as I said, the user engagement the social science of you know, what makes a forecast useful, used, interpreted in the right way. So various recommendations on that sort of first theme of the application of these forecasts. On the science side, probably as you'd expect, various recommendations on models, the importance of reducing errors, what observations do we need for subseasonal to seasonal prediction, the importance of data, assim data assimilation, both atmosphere and other Earth system components, and the ideas of bringing in 
you know, the effect of the ocean, the memory of the land surface, the memory of, of snow cover. So extra earth system components to give us more predictability. And then in terms of the actual forecast systems themselves, there are various recommendations relating to multi-model systems, verification and understanding forecasts of opportunity. You know, some conditions we can forecast confidently further out than others research to operations, and also various issues around infrastructure, technology, and the workforce issues with this sitting on the sort of the bridge between weather and climate. The next slide, please. I thought I'd briefly just mention the sort of the broader international context that I think this report sat in. So this is a slide on the WWRP to WCRP sub-seasonal to seasonal prediction project. So a Andrew Robertson, who I believe is on this call, was the co-chair of this whole global effort alongside Frederick Vitar from ECNWF. So this ran from 2013 to just, just finished this year. And I thought it was quite interesting just looking at the bullet points on this slide summarizing that project. It talks about improving forecast skill with an emphasis on high impact weather events. There's a, there's a bullet on uptake by operations and exploitation by the applications community. So I think those two bullets are extremely consistent with the sort of the research agenda of yeah, making these S2S forecasts better and getting them used. A, there was a conscious effort in this S2S project on bringing together the weather and climate community, which ties in with the, the, the session there is in this meeting today on weather and climate, the panel. And also another of the achievements of this project was the big S2S database, which was a database of the ma major global centers in this space. And that's a, a ma major facility for, for research. And I'm, I'm sure in this meeting we'll hear in particular about the sort of the, the US multi-model efforts as well. So I, th I thought that was sort of reassuring that the sort of, you know, the, the broad sort of WMO driven research agenda, I think is very consistent with what 2016 report came up with. Next slide, please. Just got a, a couple of slides. Sort of, well, are, are we are we get, are we getting somewhere? So this first one is ECMWF examples, but just because they were the easiest for me to grab hold of. So the plot on the bottom left is just showing the length of time ahead that we can forecast the Madden Julian oscillation. So one of the major modes of variability in the tropics. It's one of the major sources of predictability for sub-seasonal timescales. So we've got year along the bottom running for about a 20 year period. And you know, if, if the lines are going up, then our forecasts are getting better over time. And so the, the, re the reassuring news is you know, like if I showed a plot from medium range NWP, we can show that these sub-seasonal predictions of MJO predictability are getting significantly better you know we three in four weeks ahead we can do a, a decent forecast of the mjo and if you look at the top right that's just another example that's three week three forecasts of two meter temperature in the northern extra tropics and again on this line this is a probabilistic skill score but if it's going up we're, we're getting better and i think again you'd agree that over a sort of 10 or 15 year period there's been significant improvements so i think that's Re reassuring that the sort of the research directions that you know, we at Eastern WF are entirely consistent with the broader international community and the agenda in the report. I think we are getting better. We have the next slide, please. This is just one other example that came out of the S2S project. And I chose this one just as an example of looking at forecasts that are more directly user relevant, you know, not, not just using some traditional meteorological me measure, but this is looking at you know, how accurately we can predict the edge of Arctic sea ice. You know, that might be very important for ship routing. So in this plot, because, because it's an error measure, down is good. And, and what this is showing is as a function of lead time, you know, how, how good different models are at predicting the sea ice and you can see that the, the best forecast there you now there is you know a skill horizon of up to a month for the, the edge of the arctic sea ice so both you know we've got skill in these systems and this is just one one example of hundreds i'm sure of you know tr trying to apply it to user relevant problems the next slide please 
Oh, just a, a, a quick plug, having mentioned the WMO subseasonal to seasonal project. There's the follow on project now called SAGE, looking at sub seasonal applications for agriculture and the environment. I, I won't go into the details of this, but again, you can see for two specific sectors, agriculture and environment, it's again, it's decided that it's very much the same agenda. When and why do forecasts have scale? How do we communicate it? How do we get this decision making? So, uh, up to now, I think I'm concluding, you know. The report was set it, setting the right directions. I still think they make sense now. And I think, you know, as a global community, we are making progress along these various axes. Not enough. We're certainly not as used as weather forecasts, but we're getting better. So next slide, please. So I was also asked to talk about, well, is there anything missing from the report? So th th this is the elephant in the room and the very, very obvious elephant in the room. And again, I think, <laughs> consistent with the structure of this meeting, the rise of data-driven forecasting, machine learning. I don't think, when, well, when we were thinking about this seven years ago, I don't think anybody was anticipating the, the, the speed of developments here. I've, I won't show a lot on this, but I've just got a handful of slides, which hopefully will sort of motivate and lead into the more detailed session coming later this evening. So next slide, please. So th this is just looking at medium range weather forecasting. So I mean, two, two years ago, ECMWF had a strategy of, we're not, we're not doing data-driven forecasting. We, we, we think the traditional methods will definitely win through. This is just some of the major sort of breakthroughs has been by various groups around the world. You know, in the space of the last year or two, the rate of progress in this field has been astronomical. It's, it's a mistake having slides like this because you have to update them about every three weeks with the, the latest breakthrough. So can I have the next slide, please? So I'm still on medium range forecasting here. So on the, from left to right, day one to day 10 forecasts and up and down, just how accurate we are. At, this is geopotential height. So how, how accurate we are at forecasting you know, synoptic systems in the Northern Hemisphere. So up is good. The red line is the IFS, the Eastern WF Deterministic Forecasting System, which I think I can honestly say is the, is the most accurate in the world. The two lines that are higher up than the IFS are the Deep, Deep Minds Graphcast model and the ECMWF data-driven model that we've developed in the last year. So, yeah. It, it's it's quite dramatic. <laughs> so on medium range forecasting, you can still ask questions about what variables and does it do high enough resolution? But you know, it seems inconceivable for medium range forecasting that data driven modeling does, isn't part of the solution to how we as a community forecast the weather. Have the next slide, or just click on. And so, yeah, the obvious question is, well, what what's the application for subseasonal to seasonal prediction. And you can think of maybe different levels of radicalness. I mean, one is using machine learning to do cleverer post-processing or calibration of traditional models. You can do hybrid models where you do, do a bit of a mix and match and replace parts of the models. Or as I've just been showing for the medium range, you could completely replace the model. I think I've just got two examples. So next slide, please. So this was a couple of years ago, the WMO set up an, an S2S machine learning challenge where you know, various groups around the world in an sort of open source way were challenged to, can you beat the ECMWF forecasts? And lots of groups took the challenge and five groups did beat the ECMWF operational forecasts. I think it's fair to say in this exercise that mainly that was being done by doing clever, cleverer machine learning post-processing on top of the traditional models. So they were taking the traditional systems and doing better calibration, better post-processing. So maybe, yeah, exciting, but may maybe not radically, radically different. If I go to the next slide, please. Andy, if we could try to wrap up in the next minute or yep, so. Yeah, I've got this in one more slide. Yep. Okay. So this is just looking at, well, let's just take the model I showed for medium range prediction and just run it out for longer and see what happens. So for, for the MJO. And for the first couple of weeks, 
it's matching the ECNWF system. Weeks three and four, it's not quite. The data-driven models aren't quite matching the, tr the traditional physics-based model, but this is first shot out of the box. So I think, you know, there's a really exciting open questions as to what, what would this plot look like even in a year's time? So on the final slide, please. So yeah, so, so this was, here's the committee's vision again from last time. We'll be as widely used a decade from now as where the forecasts are today. I don't think that will be achieved, but we should keep happening. I think the, the vision it set out by and large was right and remains right. And just with one more click, please. I'm expecting some. So uh, I've just added to what the committee actually said. We should do everything the committee said we should do, and we should take advantage of the opportunities presented by machine learning. That's me. Excellent. Thank you, Andy. Great, great start. Uh, good overview of the meeting and also what's happened in these last seven years, including your job change. Uh, <laughs> uh, great. Yeah, it, it's exciting. Uh, you really covered a lot of the highlights and I think what we were hoping to hear as we move into the three following panels. Um, do we have any questions? I don't see raised hands. If I'm supposed to, I don't see them. And in chat, or again, so two ways to get to us. Uh, we just have a few minutes, maybe five minutes or so here uh, before we, we move on. Okay, Libby, excellent. You're... Yeah, Andy, thank you for that great overview. Um, Given your role and how you've seen everything unfold, how do you see you know, the difference between the medium range with the AI models versus the S2S range? You showed sort of that elbow in your final slide. Yeah. Um, and you said, you know, this is really exciting times, but do you see those as different problems or just, you know, tweak a few parameters, retrain, and we're going to be good to go? Um. I mean, I, I, I should give the caveat before I say anything that this is, you know, so fast moving and so new. That was really, a, I showed that a, a, as an example. I certainly, I certainly think they will do better. I, you can think of ver various things that could be done, change, changing the training regime. Maybe one caveat I should put in in general is the data driven models by and large up to now have been deterministic and, you know, clearly, well, even for the medium range, but certainly for the more extended and seasonal predictions, they clearly need to get to sort of on ensemble. So there's definitely work that needs to be done. I think the further out you go, potentially the more challenging it, more challenging it is, but I don't see any fundamental barrier. So I don't, my hypothesis would be in five years time, I don't think it would be a complete takeover by data-driven methods, but I would expect operational systems to be some mix and match of the two. Okay, thanks, Libby. Uh, Sanji, you have your question? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, this was a great, and it, uh, it's really good to see, like you emphasize some of the data-driven part in the forecasting. My question is, where does the fundamental science comes into the play? If you are using ECMWF data as a kind of input to your model, and then mm -hmm. yes, machine learning as how I many like billion to billion of parameter, yes, it can give you a better prediction. But what do we understand from there? And by emphasizing too much on kind of a machine learning, are we leaving like we do not need to understand any system? No. So can you comment no. on that? No, I, I agree. I, I think there'll be an, always be a need for understanding that this becomes even more true as you get out you know, through seasonal and into sort of you know, cl climate type questions where the sort of, you know, the, the understanding that the hy hypothesis testing understanding how the real world works really matter. Even on the if the operational predictions are going to these machine learning models, I mean, that they are utterly reliant, at the moment at least, on reanalysis. And that reanalysis itself 
is is absolutely dependent on on physics and data assimilation. And so, e e even if we took the extreme position, which I don't, that fully data driven for operations, yeah, you you need to get the data from somewhere, and that data has relied on the traditional understanding. Okay, we can maybe take one more. It's 11 on the West Coast, so it's the top of the hour. A couple of questions just on the data. You just mentioned, Andy, about the importance of, of the data. Uh, first question was pointing out specifically the data gaps in the Southern Hemisphere, tropical areas, and over the oceans. And I guess the impact in, in, uh, on that in, in the progress here, and then also thoughts on solutions, mm -hmm. if you keep it short, though. <laughs> yeah. And we'll move on. I mean, certainly, I mean, in terms of the atmosphere, we've got tremendously better at understanding how to properly use satellite data. If you look at weather forecasts 20 years ago, we were massively better at forecasting for the Northern Hemisphere than the Southern Hemisphere because we had much more traditional data in the Northern Hemisphere. If you look now, there's not much difference between them. So I think on, on the, purely as an atmospheric problem, I'm not so worried because we still need the, the traditional data, but the satellite data alongside the traditional data fills in the gaps. Probably for sub-seasonal to seasonal forecasting, where you do get into is the extra challenges of wanting detailed data on snow or in the ocean. The, the, if you like, the, the non-atmospheric quantities where, you know, which are sources of predictability for sub-seasonal and seasonal predictions, and you, you can't measure with a satellite. So yeah, there's been interesting work looking at you know what ocean observations are important in the tropical Pacific and tropical moorings and the like. So yes, important issues on the data side. Yeah, excellent. So I think that, and probably throughout the afternoon, it, it, the chat will continue. And if if especially the panelists would kind of monitor if you have the time and and possibly continue or answer some of those questions. But it's important that we stay. To our agenda. So I, at this point, I'm going to hand it off. Thank Andy one more time. Thank you. And then move on to the first panel. And that will be Mary Glacken moderating. So thank you. And Andy, great job. I think that's just what we were envisioning to set the stage here. Um, so I'm Mary Glacken. I'm the chair of BASC. And I'll, as was uh, mentioned earlier, I'll be moderating this session. And the way we're going to run it is we have five speakers here, and we're gonna hear from them in turn for five minutes each uh, in the order that's presented here. And then we'll reserve 25 minutes for the end for Q and A. So this session, this session is really set up, all three sessions play together, but this is really underscoring the, the usefulness part of this. So it's digging into a little bit this issue of uh, improving our understanding and this quantification of uncertainty. And so <clears throat> you can see the kind of questions we've offered the speakers shown here, and then the actual usefulness of these forecasts. Um, I like the way Andy mentioned, it's really an aspirational goal that's out there to have these forecasts be as um, used as the weather forecasts are. So without further ado, um, uh, I'm going to turn the mic to Steve Yeager, who is going to kick us off in the session. Uh, Steve? Well, thanks for the opportunity to share my thoughts on uncertainty in seasonal prediction. Um, I really uh, had to grapple with the, the vastness of this topic in pre preparing these slides. I thought I'd start off with just some examples to motivate my thinking. If we start off up here on the upper left, uh, here's an example of a um, skill map from our um, seasonal prediction system. We call it SMILE. It uses the CSM2 fully coupled model. And um, this shows the, the precipitation skill for March, April, May, when we initialize in November. And you can see that um, our skill for uh, this quantity over the continental United States is quite low. It's below 0.5. So we have inherent uncertainty uh, in, in uh, producing a forecast of, of seasonal precipitation from our system uh, associated with this low skill score. 
but this is an aggregate skill uh, over all of our verification years from 1970 to present. And there's certainly this idea of forecast of opportunity. So some years uh, we might be able to predict this uh, precipitation anomaly map more skillfully than others. So the, the, the bottom panel shows the skill fraction uh, of, of the skill shown in the top panel that's coming from large ENSO years. So this is uh, looking at years where the DJF Nino 3-4 index is, is outside of the 1.5 sigma uh, value. So that's roughly 25% of our verification years. And you can see that our skill for precipitation over California, uh, more than 90% of that comes from 25% of years. So we have these uh, this evidence that um, in certain years we have an opportunity to make a forecast that might actually uh, have higher confidence. So this is a this is the sort of target field, but um, underlying this is is the predictability of the ocean that we think provides um, the memory or the forcing for the atmosphere. And so I'm showing you here um, a map of our uh, SST skill when we initialize in November as a function of forecast month. You can see that the scale is high in the tropical Pacific, but it degrades with lead time. Um, and you can also see that our extra tropical skill degrades quite a bit. And it's unclear to what extent that matters or that adds to the uncertainty in things like our precipitation forecast. And this anomaly skill map is, is sweeping under the rug SST bias that develops in the coupled model. So there's this uncertainty whether the atmospheric response is, is um, um, being um, perturbed by that, that SST bias development. So if we think that ENSO is the really key um, forcing for the atmosphere, then we can look just at ENSO forecasts, and we have quite high skill for the Nino 3-4 index on seasonal time scales. This is when we initialize in November, high skill with correlations above 0.9, 0.9, and we're getting a, a forecast for the coming DGF of, of plus two degrees Celsius. As we go further back in time, our confidence or our uncertainty grows um, because our skill degrades. And you can see that when we initialize this um, system in May of this year, uh, we're predicting a much larger event, although the uncertainty range did span uh, our eventual two degree um, um, forecast. But we have some evidence that even at a seven month lead for large events, we, we are able to predict these events um, seven months in advance. So again, this, this idea of forecast of opportunity. And then if we look even further back, when we look at a 19 month lead forecast of, of Nino 3-4, um, there's non-stationarity. So we can see that in the late 70s and early 80s, we actually had quite good skill at predicting uh, tropical Pacific sea surface temperatures uh, more than a year and a half in advance. And that skill has degraded in recent decades. So there's some non-stationarity in our ability to predict the SST forcing. So all of this is just from a single model system. If we look at the IRI plume that was um, put out in November of this year, you can see that there's quite a bit of intermodel spread in what the forecast is for DJF Nino 3.4. The multi-model mean is hitting two, so it's in agreement with our system but clearly a lot of uncertainty coming from different systems. Yeah, Stephen, um, if you could just wrap up in a minute, that'd be great. Okay, sure. Um, so um, various sources of seasonal forecast uncertainty, some of it on intrinsic associated, associated with atmospheric variability as, as Clara Desser has written about in her papers, but also just lead time and system dependence of our ability to predict forcings, uh, our, our lead time and system dependence of skill for other forcings, soil moisture, sea ice, um, and then uncertainty in the atmospheric response to those forcings and non-stationarity of all of, of the above. So I think um, a way that I'm uh, thinking it might be useful to think about this problem is to quantify uncertainty uh, in, in ways that have been done for multi-decadal projections. So we can think about the intrinsic uh, uncertainty in our forecast the system uncertainty, and then the SST forcing uncertainty as an analogy to the scenario uncertainty from uh, multi-decadal projections. The analogy isn't perfect because the system and forcing uncertainty here are not independent, but it gives us a way to maybe uh, frame the problem and then to think about how can we quantify these different sources of um, uncertainty in our seasonal forecast and then how can we reduce them. 
So um, I'm running out of time, so I don't have time to, to go through all of these bullet points, but um, hopefully the slides will be available and um, we can we can discuss yeah. them further and take questions. Thanks. Yeah, uh, that's great. Thank you, Steve. Um, yes, uh, put questions in the chat. Maybe we can start to look at those now and uh, we will have the slides available later. So next up is Ben Kurtman. Ben? Yeah, thank you, Mary. Thank you, um, uh, Steve. Um, sort of covered a couple of the points I wanted to make. Um, <clears throat> so uh, when I started to think about this, I I started to think about how I uh, categorize uncertainty and how that might be relevant for the conversation here. And so the first way I categorize uncertainty is uncertainty that I think is uh, largely resolved. There's a, still still some more work to be done. But it, you know, largely initial condition uncertainty. And this picture on the left hand side is sort of an example of that. That you know, we have an ENSO forced, you know, 500 millibar or 200 millibar pattern, and uh, we have the noisiness associated with that pattern, or or the PNA sort of uh, stuff that we think is due to intrinsic variability that's much harder to predict, has much less predictability, and so it's the destructive and constructive interference of these two modes that lead to uh, some uh, predictability. And we over North America, and we think we have a handle on how, how to talk about that kind of uncertainty and the interaction there. And there, there's still clearly more work to be done, but we largely have a good idea of what to do about that. The second source of uh, uncertainty is uh, what I would call sort of partially resolved uncertainty. And that's the, you know, the structural uncertainties in our models. Our, you know, our models are different. They have parameterized physics that uh, we all know is not great. And, and, you know, they do it differently. And so there's this large uh, structural uncertainties. And in fact, the, many of the multi-model approaches are trying to uh, try to uh, quantify, uh, you know, or at least try to isolate that that uncertainty and how that affects forecasts. Um, and I'm going to provide a little bit of a, you know, contextual example of the North American multi-model ensemble and how that's evolved. So it's partially resolved in the, con you know, it's ad hoc. So it's just the models that are pulled off the shelf. It's very pragmatic. There are other techniques to try to resolve this, stochastic physics and other approaches, but it it's sort of partially resolved. We have some good ideas of how to go uh, within the limitations of the models that exist today. And then the last uh, part of uncertainty that that I think is most interesting and is where the research is going. And, and I think that's unresolved uncertainty. And that's, you know, fundamental missing physics. There are things that are completely missing from our models. And, and it's quite clear that they have predictability and can lead to better forecasts and better quantification of the uncertainty of forecasts. Uh, some of the examples that, that, you know, that I tend to work on are, you know, westerly wind bursts or uh, ocean mesoscale processes. And I'm going to show a couple of examples. And some of them are, are really obvious limitations of our models and missing physics, and some perhaps are, are less obvious. So just, just a you know, underscore how multi-model is at least getting at some of that, uh, uh, you know, partially resolved uncertainty. This this is a very complicated picture, so I, I apologize for that. But if you just focus on the two circles at the in the top two panels, it's a really an apples to apples comparison of you know using a single model ensemble versus a multi-model ensemble of identical sizes. And and what you're doing is you're reducing uh, overconfidence in the forecast. So this is this is really the basis for the multi-model approach, and it's it's been quite pragmatic and quite effective. Um, and here's just another example. Uh, you know, the question always rises: How many models do we need? Here's an example of using either seven or three models. Again, taken from uh, the NMME project. And so, the number of models we think is somewhere between three and seven. Uh, the problem is we just don't know which models in any particular forecast are the best. But again, you know, this within the context of our existing models, probing that structural uncertainty in an ad hoc way, there's still a lot of work to be done, but we have some ways of grasping that. We, we, we do reasonably well. And just, just this historical point about how uh, when, when models improve, uh, they you know the multi-model ensemble improves. This is showing the history of NMME. Uh, this is an anomaly correlation coefficient, but it's showing you how well we're predicting global temperatures, SSTs, and the ever-elusive precipitation. And so we do better with surface temperatures and SST, 
but uh, precipitation remains a remains a big challenge. And I would I would argue that that's uh, because we're missing many processes. And so just just and we have to can you wrap up in a minute? Thank yeah, you. I can wrap up in a minute. And just just as an example uh, that I like to show is just looking at how ocean mesoscale eddies impact uh, uh, rainfall uh, in in the West. Uh, a process that is completely missed by the NMME system. But if you take a system that has resolved the ocean eddies in it, then you capture that that influence, that upstream influence of ocean uh, mesoscale processes. And the last the last example I'm going to put it, and this one's obvious. If you want to capture this is this is the forecast climatology from one of the NMME models at 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 NME resolution and at higher resolution. And if you want to get the snow right, I mean, even close, you have to resolve the topographic features. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to get rain on snow right. You're not going to get water resource management right. You're going to make some huge mistakes. And so there are missing things that we really need to, to do a better job on. And so let me just end there that, yeah, there's unresolved uncertainty that we're not, we're really not even scratching the surface. I think we're, we're barely doing enough uh, and I think that has an important feedback onto systematic errors, systematic errors, systematic errors. And I'll say it one more time, systematic errors are profoundly important and we're not, we're de definitely not doing enough to fix those. Initialization and data assimilation, of course, is important, but I, I think we're forgetting that there's an initialization problem that's somewhat, uh, you know, the, it's not exactly data assimilation, it's something other, and we need to think about that, and this is a particularly true for, for capturing low frequency variability. And then my last point that I, I, I think is of most important, we're not providing a framework where we can rapidly transition research in, in, into operations. We've tried over and over again, we've done many things, but we just haven't gotten there yet, as we need an, a framework where uh, uh, ideas can be tested in op models that are used for operational prediction and so that the research community can influence operational prediction immediately. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. And if someone has a question about this lovely picture on the left, I'm more than happy to answer that offline. Okay. I myself could talk about this for a while or ask questions, but we're going to move along here. Uh, I will remind the audience to feel free to put questions into the chat. Um, next, we'll hear from Kathy Pichon. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I kind of took this perspective about uncertainty um, to be about skill and understanding where we stand. Um, and so I'm going to talk about lessons learned from the subseasonal experiment. Um, and so I, I was trying to think about what have we accomplished in terms of subseasonal prediction, um, in terms of its skill and, and, and useful ability to make forecasts. And, and um, I realized that when this report came out, we could not robustly quantify how good, how, what we could do, what we could and couldn't do, what is our current skill, where do we stand, um, because we didn't have a good framework for that. And now we can robustly um, provide skill um, estimates in terms of deterministic and probabilistic skill. Um, and one of the things that really impressed on me that we've learned from um, um, since this report is, and you saw example of MJO skill. Um, MJO was the focus of predictability um, at the time. And now we understand, as you've seen from the previous um, two talks as well, that we have to consider many sources of predictability um, to find skill on subseasonal time scales. Um, I'll highlight we now have CONUS operational products um, and we have tools for forecast guidance. Um, and one of the things I think about this report was that it was very user focused. Um, and I feel like at the time it came out, we were not really ready to work with users because we didn't understand what we didn't, didn't know um, very well on subseasonal time scales. And now we see evidence of co-production and working um, with users. So how does, um, Sub X come into play. So Sub X was a U.S. effort um, to that really provided this uh, experimental framework infrastructure um, that that supported these kinds of accomplishments and ability to assess our skill um, and you know make probabilistic multi-model ensemble forecasts. Um, and we had seven global ensemble prediction systems. It provided 17 years of reforecast um, and seven years of real-time forecast supporting research to operations. And I think the key factor here is that it provided a public database of reforecast and real-time forecast, and that was is used for application for research for training machine learning and AI models, um, and just the in research impact that having this experimental framework um, has. You can see that there's more than 200 citations of this paper, and so I really want to um, highlight what 
um, what did we learn from this? And I feel like there's so much work that's been done that it's really hard to pick individual pictures or, or examples of specific um, projects because there's so much that's come together. So I just hit some highlights here um, and kind of as bullet points. Um, we learned that subseasonal prediction is indeed possible. Um, you know, we were not doing it um, when this project came out very substantially, and now we see it going on robustly. Um, and then I want to highlight the importance of multi-model ensemble. Um, no single model stands out um, in, in, uh, in the efforts that were done um, within um, SubX. We, didn't, we can't identify one model that's better than all the others. Um, and I think that that's really the key is that, that, that representing of the uncertainty, that, um, that model uncertainty, the, the, the parameterization uncertainty um, is really being um, handled by our multi-model ensemble. The thing that I'll also highlight again, still varies due to a wide variety of sources of predictability, many different projects studying different sources of predictability, and that those sources of predictability have to, multiple ones kind of come together to give us um, um, a signal in, in a small signal, large noise situation that we have on subseasonal time scales. Um, kind of in a more um, technical sense, subseasonal is more demanding than seasonal. The compute and the data um, uh, infrastructure demands are, are, are not trivial. Um, we found in SubX that there's a demand for subseasonal forecasts beyond just the operational products, that there are users who want to take this data and use it for specific purposes. And so now that we understand our skill, we understand, um, as you've seen reference to, temperature skill is better than precipitation skill. Uh, we know which regions we have more skill and less skill. Um, we know enough to engage in co-production and collaboration with users. So I'll just highlight a few next steps, things I think we've learned from SubX and then we need to go forward with in terms of improving our subseasonal skill um, and usefulness. Uh, we need to better leverage these forecasts of opportunity. I, I feel like this is our best hope for better skill on these timescales. And we've seen many studies showing um, how, you know, many different types of forecasts of opportunity, identifying forecasts of opportunity. Um, but we really are not using that, I think, in a very um, good and systematic way to its fullest. Um, and then I'll underscore what Ben mentioned about a, an experimental prediction framework. We need a stable user-focused infrastructure where we have this, this um, uh, prediction framework of, of reforecast, ability to evaluate skill, and real-time forecast. And our current subseasonal infrastructure is fragile and not sustainable. Um, and then there's this issue of support for users. This is um, large multi-dimensional data sets, um, and it's challenging for non-specialists. So I think to really um, support the uptake of um, subseasonal predictions um, and meet this, um, fully meet the goal of of the report. We need to provide better support to users in working with these data sets to be able to get to the information that they need. So I'll conclude there and thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I was just about to give you a one minute warning. <laughs> thank you, what a treat. Um, Mike Anderson. All right, everybody. Now, totally different. Uh, my name is Michael Anderson, state climatologist for California. I get to take all this information and try and figure out how to inform resource management in the state's response to extremes. So let's go to the next slide. I'm going to look at this first from the biggest scale. X-axis is the statewide average temperature for a year. Y-axis is the statewide accumulated precipitation. Big triangle is the period of record average. Circles are 20th century squares. 21st century, a few years a note in there, including 22 as the gold star, 23 as the purple star. So easiest question for seasonal forecasting this time of year for California, is it gonna be wet or dry? So really only looking where on the vertical axis are we gonna be? Good question. Um, trying to add a little more into it, are we warm or cold? And you can see with the squares, that answer was pretty easy for most years of the 21st century. We've really only had three years that fall into what we would call a cold year, including last year, a little bit of a surprise, uh, based on the information that we have at this time. So let's go to the next slide, try and dial it in, make it a little more useful. All righty, so this is the past decade. And this is taking snowpack 
precip and temperature, three key elements to water resource management. Now looking how it falls in the historical distribution. Does it fall into the expected category, the middle of the distribution? Not too many years fell in there. In fact, only 2016, the Godzilla El Nino fell into that area for precip and snowpack. Uh, the square, orange squares, temperature you see really lying almost in the extreme or anomalously warm category until last year when a little bit of curveball thrown in. Uh, what we look at this in terms of resource management and planning to extremes. We know what to do if it falls in the expected zone. Our entire systems are built on that. And it's a bit of a bummer that only once in a decade we actually end up there and can have everything work out nicely. Uh, when things are anomalous, have to make some changes, have to adapt. Uh, within year, we can probably do that. So when we get to extremes that we really need to look at some of those bigger response components, sometimes taking uh, legislative action, budgetary action that takes a lot of time to negotiate. So the longer the lead time, the better. So where do we fall? Where are we going to fall? And then uh, how, how do we provide context to this? Let's go to the next slide. Let's break it down even further. So we're going to talk about building a water year. And then put up here, this is what I used this year. And I talk about what happened last year. Uh, what happened this past water year was really fantastic because we start the water year entering potentially year four of a drought with the La Nina in place. All expectations are that's where we're going to end up. And up until Christmas, we were spot on. We were setting new records uh, for dry conditions and low water availability. Lo and behold, after Christmas, everything changed on a dime. Now, category B, the January atmospheric rivers, provided winter in 18 days. 86% of a seasonal snowpack accumulated in those 18 days, and 46% of the water year precipitation fell in that time zone. Uh, great for annual statistics, right? Not much of it's usable when it happens that quickly. Another thing. And it goes dry again for a month. Then we throw in a new twist. Let's do cold storms that are really wet and put snow where people don't necessarily like snow or where they're not able to handle it. So we have people in Napa, snowbound. Uh, so some new challenges there. Uh, but we're not done there yet because then we follow on with more atmospheric rivers. These really hitting the Tulare Lake bed region and really starting the beginning of the reemergence of Tulare Lake, first time since 1983. Uh, these Storms provided so much water that small creeks below the regulatory dams provided flows that exceeded the downstream channel capacity of the major rivers. So we're thing, seeing things on a scale completely unlike anything uh, we have as a historical guide. A little bit of a challenge. Mike, if you could wrap up in the next minute. Yep, last slide, we're on it next. So here's how we look at it. If I'm talking about forecasting a water year, this is how I break it down, break it down seasonally. Looking at when we get our fall precip onset, that's really important. That has a lot of impact in terms of our spring runoff. Uh, warm or cold, when do we get those um, monster heat waves? Or when do we get some surprising colds? Those are important for our uh, at-risk populations. And the soil moisture state when that snowpack sets in because that helps guide spring runoff. Winter is wet or dry, spring, late season bailout, early shutoff. Knowing if we got a long wet season, short wet season, really important. But maybe forgotten is the summer. How quickly do things dry out? Take advantage of our Mediterranean climate, understanding wet season, dry season, but understanding how those play out, how the seasonal progression might be disrupted. What are those disruptors? Is it something anomalous or extreme? Once we get to April, we like to know, well, what about next year? So multi-year prediction, still important, and understanding climate change. How much different are things going to be relative to our history? Because it's not playing out the same. And that's all I have. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. You really make your job sound appealing there. <laughs> or I guess our challenge is, how do we make your, your job easier? Um, the last uh, speaker in the session is Linda Herons. Am I not sure I'm saying your last name correctly? Please correct me if I'm wrong. Hi, yeah, Linda Hirons, that's fine. Um, I'm based at the National Center of Atmospheric Science in the University of Reading. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a bit about some of what's been touched on here. 
but using a co-production approach to support more effective application of subseasonal forecasts with case studies uh, across Africa. So quite a different, a different step here. Um, this is all part of work that was the Global Challenges Research Fund GCRF African SWIFT project, and African SWIFT had access to real-time subseasonal forecast data as part of the S2S prediction project real-time pilot, along with other projects as well. So I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, so really, within this and with the real-time access to subseasonal data, we were running a forecast testbed where we were had prototype forecast products that were co-produced and operationally trialed in real time. And here, a lot of people have touched on this, but really we're trying to understand where skill and use overlap. So the co-production approach brings together different knowledge sources, experiences and working practices to jointly address these issues of shared concern. And in the weather context, this is really transforming the forecast user from being a recipient of information to actually being participant in how that in information is being generated and how it's developed and communicated. So uh, some of this has been touched on, but on the skillful side, we really want to understand why, where and when our subseasonal forecasts have skill. So do we understand the regime dependent skill? Do we understand the sources of predictability? Can we say uh, with more certainty uh, when particular times have skills? So this is an example from a study within the project looking at the East African long rains during March, April, May. And I don't have time to go into the details, but you can see here that the, uh, the if you have the observed response to the MJO, then you have you have um, enhanced skill in weeks three and four. So this is really about understanding those windows of opportunity, forecast opportunity that people have been talking about. So understanding why, where and when we have skill. On the other side, we need to understand what decisions users are actually trying to make. So how can these forecasts be translated into things that are actually supporting real life decisions? How can they build resilience and, and build the resilience in these at-risk communities? So within SWIFT, we had uh, six different operational groups across these sectors. Um, and within each of these groups, we had forecast users, forecast producers. We had um, researchers coming together to have an iterative dialogue around where the skill and the windows of opportunities are and how that can be interrogated to inform some of the decisions that were being made in these, in these contexts. Um, and there's lots of different papers covering those studies, and you can read more about those. But just two quick examples. So within Kenya, we were working with Kengen, an energy company, to, to develop bespoke forecast to support hydropower planning. So this was um, producing precipitation forecasts to help our energy planners um, maximize the dam levels within Kenya so that they could maximize the use of hydropower. And actually during this three-year forecasting test, but they had un they were able to have unprecedented, uninterrupted energy during that time. So these forecasts really have um, key applications. Another example, working with ACMAD, who are a pan-African uh, organization, uh, African organization and we were working with users from the WMO, the World Health Organization, to help co-develop early warnings for meningitis out outbreaks. So this was producing bespoke multi-variable subseasonal forecasts for men meningitis early warning, combining uh, variables that we know to affect meningitis, but combining those with user-defined thresholds, health thresholds, to help us understand the regions that are going to have more likely to have meningitis. And we were able to extend that preparedness action window by up to two weeks um, in some cases. So it's really useful information being provided directly and co-produced with users. So I'm really kind of advocating here that you need to understand both of these parts of the problem. So you need to understand where the skill is, why, where, and when you have that skill, understand the regime dependent skill and the drivers, but also understanding what these services are actually being used and how they're being used to make decisions. And that's where you're gonna find reliable and actionable cl climate services by co-producing these services with the users. And some people have touched on this already. Um, but it has challenges, and this is the last part I want to touch on. So some of the lessons that we've been drawing from this, actually having an iterative ongoing uh, dialogue with users involves building relationships and maintaining relationships. And that is really resource intensive and it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of people working in different ways from maybe they're used to. So following on from that, that requires capacity building of all of the groups involved. It, it involves uh, users helping users to understand what windows of opportunity mean, that there might be more certainty in a forecast at different times on spatial and temporal 
um, scales, but it's also about us as researchers and forecast producers understanding the context into which these forecasts are being delivered, how they're being used. And leading on from that, evaluating those forecasts, we can't just use meteorological metrics of verification to evaluate our forecasts. We need to be thinking broader than that and understanding the value of these forecasts in terms of whether they're actually helping to support a decision. And this links with what Andy was talking about, about the next stage of the S2S prediction project, moving on to SAGE, where within SAGE, there's going to be a whole value chain look at this, all the way from the underpinning science supporting the skillful prediction, but through to the application to users. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Linda. OK, um, we now have at least 15 minutes uh, for questions. And I see Neil has his hand up. Um, so Neil, uh, well, can we repin the, yeah, somebody's doing it to pin the panelists. Go ahead, That's Neil. That's painful. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Um, I, I have a, a one general question and one very quick specific one, but just to educate me, I'm a poor atmospheric chemist, but my uh, understanding was the, um, the, the, the limitation on short-term forecasts I did learn meteorology from Ed Lorenz was effectively a couple of weeks chaos time scale where predictability kind of goes out the window on a synoptic spatial scale. Uh, first of all, I might be completely wrong. Tell me if I am. But then what is the equivalent at the S2S scale? What are the spatial scales and what are we up against in terms of some sort of chaotic envelope of the variability? Oh, and the specific question was to Mike, isn't isn't your 21st century shift just climate change, like the last thing you had on your slide? For an answer, yes. Okay. Now, first question. <laughs> yeah, anybody want to take What's the chaos time? scale? I, I guess my bias is I think all scales are chaotic. Um, I think there's chaos on the largest scales. Uh, as well as on the smallest scales. In fact, um, uh, I think you can you can show I think you can show from a dynamical systems perspective that the ENSO four signal exhibits chaotic behavior. Yeah, but they have different temporal and the, the temporal and spatial scales are correlated. So that was what I was sort of trying to get at, and how yeah. it applies in this S two S window. Yeah, I have to think about it. I'm not sure. Okay, I'll turn it on its ear a bit here. Uh, we think about seasonal progression, right? In the absence of any forecast information, you can rely on climatology. We know how things progress from the solstice, to the equinox, equinox to solstice in each of the four seasons. We have geophysical elements that we can start there. Then we try and look at where in the Earth system you have disruptors to that. And I think it's understanding the scale of those disruptors, where they originate, and then their influence that interrupt that progression to an extent that it would motivate some type of response. Okay, let's move on to another question, Linda. Um, yeah, thanks, Mary. Uh, this question is primary, uh, primarily for Linda but others could certainly join in. Um, yeah, it's about, I really appreciate your focusing on the uh, co-production aspect of this. Um, and as you know, of course, co-production is a very big topic in terms of long-term climate change. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you could comment about what can be learned about co-production across those time scales. In other words, for example, what could long-term climate change folks working with co-production learn from co-production on seasonal time scales? Yeah, thanks for your question. Great question. I think uh, there's a lot there's a lot to learn and it touches on one of the questions in the in the chat as well around how you scale co-production because it's mm -hmm. very bespoke it's very unique to a context and it involves a, a relationship that you build on but i think by freight by using these frameworks for co-production and understanding i rushed through it but the building blocks of co-production and how you run through that iterative process about co-exploring the need co-developing -de those solutions co-delivering those solutions having a framework like that that you can uh 
pick up and, and scale to other areas and other contexts is really helpful. Um, how we learn across timescales, I think it's very different in climate, longer term climate, because here we were running an operational test bed with new forecasts mm -hmm. every week. So uh, it was very much a moving target. But I think we can definitely learn from the different timescales and apply some of those lessons. So just to give a really quick follow up question. Do you think the fact that on season to season for forecasting timing, you can actually verify them? Right, you can verify the forecasts in a timely fashion, whereas for longer term climate change, you sort of can't. And how do you think, do you think that difference um, can be explored in a way to help the longer term climate change people? Yeah, so it's an important point that you're working on timescales within which you can verify what you said, what you said last month, you can mm -hmm. verify verify next month which is really helpful and it helps you build that uh that database of, of those windows of opportunity and how they apply so i think we can yeah how you how you apply that to longer term long term climate projections is challenging one thing we need to remember when it comes to co-producing with users is that they don't think in weather and timing weather and climate time scales they just think in planning right. time scales okay. so right. though those sorts of questions are being asked by these energy planners in Kenya, the longer term. So, so it's all linked in, in a user's mind, I think, in some aspects. Right. Thank you. Uh, Effie. Yeah. So uh, Ben mentioned the importance of systematic error, systematic error, systematic errors. And we know that AI, if it is good in anything, is to learn systematic things, meaning patterns that systematically appear. So can I assume that there is a fast ho a hope to make fast progress in this intermediate thing on basically post-processing on top of traditional models? Yeah, I, I think I think certainly correcting the anomalies, um, the systematic errors in the anomalies is possible. But the way I sort of think about teleconnections in general is that they're superimposed upon the mean state of the climate of the model. If that mean state is dorked up, if you will, then then the teleconnection is likely to be dorked up. And so we really do need to figure out how to make sure our tools, uh, as the forecast evolves, have much smaller systematic errors. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. Uh, Joe? Yeah, thank you. I don't know why my camera is not coming on. I apologize for that. Um, a question for for Linda and and perhaps others as well. You you talked about you know the challenges or the the mission to get this information into the hands of decision makers so that it actually can be um, kind of acted upon. And this is a big question, but briefly, what kinds of strategies, techniques, methods are being used to actually kind of make that connection explicit versus just kind of putting the information out there and hoping for the best. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I heard somebody at the climate conference in Kigali talking about throwing a forecast to a user and hoping they catch it. So, I mean, I think I think we can do a lot better than that. Um, and I think in in this in this context, it was about relationship, and it was about having a three year long relationship where we were interacting with users weekly to understand the challenges as they were, you know, as we were kind of battling with that uncertainty together. Um, a real challenge here, here is the sustainability of that because it's part of a project initiated service, right? It's li linked to a research project. And, and, and as that was linked to a WMO real-time pilot, which was finishing and access to that data of real time was finishing. So I think there's, there's a real challenge there, but relationships are key to, to making sure that those forecasts can be can be answering a context question, but also co-evaluated as well. Hey, Thank I'm you. Gonna, um, interject a question of my own here, and I want to go back. I think Ben made this point, but we heard it alluded to further. I think with Kathy is the point about test beds, where um, you know that we have setups in a way that can really help us towards um, um, evaluating. Uh, the usefulness. Ben, can you comment on that a little more? 
Well, it's very, I think fundamentally, it's very hard to, uh, for uh, individual researchers to envision how their uh, research is ultimately going to influence uh, uh, operational forecasts and the uptake of operational forecasts when they're not able to use the operational systems, if you will, to uh, test ideas. And so it's it's hard to get that community to rally behind uh, really digging in and trying to figure out better ways of improving um, uh, operational forecasts without them being able to use that in research. And, and that that requires a fair amount of infrastructure and support to provide uh, models, data, data simulation systems, and computational infrastructure so that researchers can actually uh, engage in uh, the models that are used to make forecasts. Okay. And you mentioned that we've tried to do this. Is it, are our efforts failing because of resources behind it and commitment? I think the simplest answer to that is yes, we're not providing enough resources. There are examples of, of, of success, and I would say modest success. You know, the NCAR family of models really encourages the research community to engage with their models. Uh, and, you know, the UFS development is trying. But to really do this right, I, I really, to have a comprehensive strategy, we, we, we need a lot more resources. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any, anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, I just want to highlight this this providing of the the, the data the data infrastructure component, right? The the ability to have these these be forecasts in available to to everyone for, for research use. Um, the availability of the um, real time forecasts um, for for applications development, and all of this you know infrastructure does indeed require significant resources. Um, you know that it's not just a, as Linda mentioned. You can't just throw it over the wall and hope that hope that the user or the researcher catches it. Um, and so, I just uh, you know, kind of underscore the importance of that of, of test beds as an important infrastructure. Yeah, and and I would comment. I think when Basque had a similar session on kind of decadal forecasting in the spring, that's one of the things that we heard there that the resources kind of required to do this actually leave us quite vulnerable that only those with the, you know, with the bankroll can really do it. So if we are interested in, in seeing some equity um, and addressing a full set of social issues here, we're gonna have to, it seems to me, we'd have to be making some changes. So um, other questions from the board and I'll be looking, um, in, um, I'm looking in the chat to see if there's anything we should be calling out there. Mary, uh, can I make a comment about the test bed uh, based on the past uh, experience in history? This is Gassam Azra. Yeah, I, I hear you, Gassam. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for your comments and Ben's and everybody. The, the, the concept of test bed is really not um, somewhat alien new to us. Um, Ben and others know that uh, within the WMO, WCRP, we have tried, we did try to do it and we, were, we succeeded by establishing the S2S um, project, uh, which was a home and the facilities and the capabilities. And it's, it, it was connected to the WMO regional centers. Uh, that was the idea behind connecting the research all the way to the users. In the US, in the early days of the Earth System Science um, uh, framework, um, we used our national capabilities uh, to the point that um, Ben was making about NCAR having the facilities and a network of universities that are the hubs of innovation. And we thought that they could be the bridge between the research community and the operational centers uh, and operational agencies such as NOAA, Navy, and others. It was the money that was required to glue the pieces together. And back then, NASA made the commitment uh, to connect the dots, so to speak. And fortunately, you know, I mean, it's, it was up to the agencies to keep the coalition together to provide the infrastructure and, and then finding the resources to, to maintain them. So we have done it and fortunately we abandoned it. I think this 
you know, uh, what we have been talking about provides the motivation to rejuvenate it, uh, re-energize it once more. So uh, it's doable. It's just a matter of bringing the, uh, the coalition of the willing together to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, well, we're um, going to draw this session to a close. Uh, I would again point people towards the chat, especially our speakers, if you have a few minutes to address any of the issues in there, that would be wonderful. We have now a 10 minute break, uh, and we'll be back at the top of the hour. I think the suggestion is just mute yourself and leave your camera on and off. Um, and um, we'll be back at that point. And I think Amy is going to moderate this next session. Amy McGovern. I am going to welcome everybody back. Glad to start if we want to switch to the slide to start our panel. Okay. Um, so I'm introducing the second panel. I'll be moderating all of the questions. I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you. I think that that first panel and the opening session brought up a lot of questions about the data driven methods and AI and machine learning methods. And so I'm excited that we're going to have a panel about that. So we have uh, one, two, three, four, five panelists um, that are each going to give um, a five minute lightning talk, just as we did with the last one, and then do questions at the end. Uh, the questions that we asked them to think about for the five minute lightning talk were how a new deep learning approach is being applied for S2S forecasting and how data driven and process based approaches to S2S forecasting are performing differently, um, which I think some of this has been discussed in the chat already. So I'm looking forward to, to all of this. Um, and I think I forgot to say who I am. I'm Amy McGovern. <laughs> I'm at the University of Oklahoma. Um, and I am going to, without further ado, uh, introduce our first speaker. And I forgot to ask, are we going in the order that they are on that? Okay, good. I guess we're going in the order that they are on that slide because I see Anish Superman, Supermanian. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, can you see my slides okay? I'm going to full screen. Yes. Great. Okay, um, thanks Amy. And yeah, a great set of talks uh, so far in this workshop. I'm really enjoying it. Thanks for the opportunity to present. I'll present um, about two applications of machine learning or data-driven methods for S2S prediction, which is largely uh, bridging the gap between weather prediction and climate um, prediction or climate forecasting. So uh, there are, there's been a lot being done on data-driven approaches or machine learning approaches for the weather timescale and the climate timescale. Not as much on the S2S timescales, but there are efforts like um, previous speakers have spoken about. Um, I've categorized the current approaches of data-driven or machine learning approaches into these four categories. The first one is where we completely replace the model, the dynamical model, um, with a machine learning based approach for prediction. So the entire prediction of forecasting is being done with a machine learning model. Um, this is being, uh, this is showing promise on the weather timescales um, as presented by Andy and others. Um, on the S2S timescale, there is effort ongoing, um, both at ECMWF and other groups, um, not as much promise as um, on the weather timescales for this. Um, but these are uh, early times for such approach. The second one, which I'll talk more about in the um, upcoming slides is um, causal discovery or inference. 
and explainable AI, where we try and discover um, teleconnections or um, uh, interactions in a system that lead to S to S prediction. The third one is post-processing of dynamical uh, forecasts. Um, there is ongoing work on this. Uh, Andy also mentioned about this. And the fourth one is hybrid modeling, where we combine dynamical models and machine learning models. So I'll present two, um, um, on two studies um, which I've been involved with, which I know most about. One of them is causal discovery analysis led by Danny Du, who's a student here at CU Boulder. Um, the approach uses uh, what's called the PCMCI, causal discovery framework, to identify sources of predictability or teleconnections into the um, Indian summer monsoon region. So the approach uses a causal discovery method. I'll not go into the details of this given the time constraint. Um, we use um, geopotential height anomalies in the tropics um, using six uh, rotated PCs of weekly geopotential height and try and identify causal links between this and uh, the summer monsoon anomalies. So using this method, we can find uh, a causal graph that identifies links between these modes of variability and the monsoon variability. Um, this is a graph showing um, the causal links between uh, in 1980 to 2001. And the bottom graph shows how this these links are changing in the uh, past two decades. So that's one approach where we see that there is a one week lead um, monsoon to monsoon um, causal uh, impact as well as a Western Pacific geopotential height impact to the Indian summer monsoon, which has not been shown very much in literature pr uh, previously. And we see that looking um, at, at a trend, the link between the Western Pacific and the Indian summer monsoon is increasing over time, whereas the causal link between the Indian summer monsoon and itself is decreasing. So that's one example. Another example is model replacement. This is work that came out of a S2S summer school that uh, Judith Berner and I organized at AST, um, where um, students looked at how machine learning methods can impact um, uh, subseasonal prediction of temperature over North America. So they use- You've got about um, one minute to wrap up, please. Yeah, yeah, this is my last slide. Um, so they use this method to identify um, how a random forest method versus a neural network method um, does in terms of week three scale of uh, temperature forecast compared to a previous method, which was uh, led by Matt Johnson. Um, the other, um, and what we see here is that the neural network was able to predict uh, better than the other two methods for week three temperature forecast. And then the other benefit of this is we can use what's called the layer-wise relevance propagation to identify which regions in the predictor are actually having an impact on the predictant. Um, and we see that uh, the tropical Pacific has a big impact in terms of predicting temperatures in south, south part of North America. So I'll end there. Um, happy to take any questions. Thanks. I will encourage questions in the chat while we switch to our next speaker, who is Kirsten Mayer. Here we go. I just realized I need to unmute myself. That would be helpful. Okay, let's see. All right, great. Okay, so my name is Kirsten Mayer and I'm a project scientist at NCAR. I'm gonna get right into it. Um, I also divided into subsections as Anish did slightly uh, differently, but um, topic, I divided into three subsections, discovery and knowledge. This is kind of like where science comes into um, data-driven methods. Performance improvement, so improving our skill or our speed. This is where I, I see data-driven forecasts or bias correction. And then trust, this idea of explainable and interpretable AI, physics-informed machine learning, and uncertainty quantification. This is not an exhaustive list, nor are they independent. I can definitely see trust falling under both discovery and knowledge and performance improvement as well. Um, but this is just a, a nice um, subsection uh, division so that I can tell you where I'm focused on in this talk, which is discovery and knowledge. And um, the, the research I'm going to present today is um, what it's not trying to do is get the best skill or the best performance for S2S forecasting. What it's doing is trying to apply machine learning tools 
specifically to better understand F2S uh, predictability, its sources, and when we may or may not have um, a good skill or these uh, forecasts of opportunity. So I'm gonna go through just very quickly, rapid fire, um, some different machine learning tools and by example, how these tools can be applied to S2S predictability to learn something about um, uh, this time scale. So one of them is the discard test, which is this method where you can remove predictions with low confidence or high uncertainty uh, with the idea that as the neural network becomes more confident, it'll be more skillful. And we've shown in previous work that as network confidence increases with skill, we can identify these higher confidence um, predictions as forecasts of opportunity. Uh, we can take it further and try to identify um, what the neural network was actually looking at with these explainable AI techniques or XAI, where we can evaluate what the neural network thought was important in the original input to make these confident and correct forecast of opportunity-esque predictions. Um, and this is just an example um, from one of my papers with Libby Barnes, um, showing that the neural network identified an MJL-like dipole structure for predictability of V500 over the North Atlantic on subseasonal timescales. But you can even look at how predictability may change, um, specifically using these tools under anthropogenic warming, stratospheric aerosol injection, or different uh, climate intervention strategies, or even how subseasonal predictability may vary on decadal time scales. Um, another interesting um, work is using interpretable AI instead of explainable AI. This is idea where you can actually look into your, your um, machine learning model to understand what it is doing. Um, in particular, this is an architecture developed in Gordon et al. Um, that we're using here, where there are two networks that are um, put together, are literally combined together to make a final prediction. So we can try to dissect the relative importance of each of these models. So in this question, in this problem, we're trying to address the question of what mode of variability, the ENSO, ENSO or the MJO, um, is most important for making Z500 uh, predictions on subseasonal timescales over the North Pacific. Lastly, I want to talk about transfer learning, and this is transfer learning combined with explainable AI techniques. Uh, transfer learning is this idea that we can train a neural network on something that has a large amount of data, like our climate models, and then use those weights to initialize training for um, something on a smaller data set, like reanalysis. And this project is trying to identify differences and if there are any differences and sources of predictability between us. Uh, a large ensemble and reanalysis, specifically the CSM2 large ensemble, by trying to explore using the explainable AI, where the neural network looked for a specific uh, subseasonal predictability problem using when it was trained on the CSM large ensemble compared to when it's trained or retrained on observation. Uh, this is a slide just to say that um, these research projects that I just briefly presented are not the only um, ones that are using explainable AI, interpretable AI. Um, the discard test, et cetera, to explore subseasonal predictability. And with that, I'll just say on a positive note, machine learning provides many opportunities to learn from large amounts of data to advance our understanding or, or even representation of our Earth system. And moving forward, I think we should continue to utilize methods from the machine learning literature in creative ways to identify and understand sources of subseasonal predictability or this forecast of opportunity idea that has been talked a lot about today, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to look at um, that today and in, under future climates. And then I think uh, where we need to improve is we need to explore and document limits of these data-driven methods for the subseasonal timescale. Machine learning can only learn from what it sees, and so I think that's a, um, something very important to remember as we continue talking about data-driven methods. Thank you, and thank you for ending on time. I was, didn't have to break in. Um, <laughs> and. I, our next speaker is Maria Molina from the University of Maryland. Hello, thank you. I'll go ahead and share screen. All good? Yep. Um, hello everybody. My name is Maria Molina from the University of Maryland in College Park. And I'll be talking about machine learning for earth system prediction and predictability. Predictability being where we consider our inherent limit or potential for skillful prediction. 
And it was interesting to see how Anish and Kirsten split up their thinking of um, uh, machine learning for Earth system prediction, especially on the sub-seasonal to seasonal timescales. I think about things a little bit differently where I like to split things up into three different stages when we're thinking about traditional numerical weather prediction or climate modeling or S2S, where we have an input stage, a running the model stage, and this being a numerical model, and also the output stage. So I'll give examples on where machine learning can fit neatly into each one of these examples. For the input stage, I'll share some work that is currently being led by a PhD student in my group at Maryland, where they are taking some um, observations from ENSO and taking um, a look at some of the precursors to um, what leads to the onset of such events. And so here we're looking at times before the springtime season and seeing that we have westerly wind bursts that take um, effect and then we're going to go ahead and continue to see these um, in intensifying over the spring and summer seasons and so essentially what we're doing is coming up with these hypothesized physical drivers that lead to an El Nino onset and then framing this experiment using machine learning to identify potential uh, ways that they can lead to correct or incorrect predictions and then comparing this to numerical models and um, and seeing how they um, relate to that. Um, another way that we're using machine learning is in the running the model stage where we are working on improving representations of physical parameterizations. One that is quite difficult is lightning activity. And so we are taking the NASA GEOS model. We are taking a replay simulation. So this is strongly constrained to observations. And we are training a neural network to go ahead and predict lightning activity as observed by the geostationary lightning mapper. And then going ahead and aiming to replace that um, parameterization with this machine learning based one. Another item of note is that while neural networks can be quite difficult to stick back into a numerical model, we're also considering symbolic regression where we can do equation discovery using, for example, genetic algorithms. And that would be a bit simpler of a way to um, do that replacement. And then finally, we can also apply machine learning to the output stage. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that one potential use case of machine learning for um, uh, S2S is going ahead and actually bias correcting that output from a traditional numerical based simulation. And so we are actively doing that and we are finding that we can indeed do that and gain some skill. But I wanna point out that it's um, not as simple as just using any metric uh, for skill what skill is defined as can vary depending on the community that you are speaking to and the stakeholders uh, respective interests as was also mentioned earlier and so what we are exploring is generating uncertainty to what is a good bias corrected forecast using a Pareto frontier and just the intersection of different potentially competing objectives or metrics. And finally, we can, of course, use machine learning to go ahead and skip altogether the numerical running the model stage where we just take an input, train a neural network to generate some output. And we can also frame experiments to learn more about the Earth system, not just purely aiming to gain more skill. Uh, one example of an experiment that we're currently conducting is led by a PhD student in my group named Jiron, who is actually going ahead and taking variables from the community Earth system model. And this is a S2S initialized hindcast and training machine learning models to explore which one of these different Earth system components yields more skill for weather regime classifications and is actually finding that we are seeing uh, results that are emerging based on our traditional understanding where we know that the atmosphere generally provides the most skill during earlier lead times and then we start to get more skill from land and ocean components later on. However, there have been some surprises specifically when you're considering splitting this up by season where we start to see some changes in where uh, most of the predictability comes from. And I won't take his thunder, so I'll let him talk about that coming up in AMS. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to share that additionally, we can also generate indices that are potentially more useful to end users or stakeholders with specific applications. In this case, we have Hannah who is um, generating an index by using an autoencoder, feeding in various variables and doing a very, very strong bottleneck where we have just one neuron having to learn the most salient information from these input variables and then reconstruct those images. And so this single node can serve as an index for uh, the um, area of interest and also the physical variables of interest. And it turns out that that can actually be uh, quite helpful when we're trying to link together different physical processes. 
And with that, I will end. Uh, so again, I hope I convince you that machine learning can be quite useful for different stages of the numerical modeling framework or, or uh, workflow, and also to simply skip together altogether the uh, running the model stage and going from an input to just an output. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm we're we're doing great on time. Y'all are awesome. Um, Dale Duran is going to be our next panelist. Um, and I think Dale and and actually our panelists after Dale are both going to uh, talk about some of this from the perspective of academia as well as uh, private industry. Are you there, Dale? Yes, I am. Waiting for, Hello, okay, I was waiting for your picture to appear. Here, I hope. Yes, good. There you are. Well, let's get this up. Okay, so uh, I'm uh, Dale Duran at the University of Washington. I'm going to talk to you about model replacement in a slightly different context than what's been in the news with uh, science and nature, namely parsimonious deep learning weather prediction. And the question I'd like us to start with is how many predictable degrees of freedom does the atmosphere actually have? And surely one thing we know is that this number must decrease with increasing forecast lead time. So when it turns to trying to predict uh, these degrees of freedom and the predictable part of the atmosphere with machine learning, we need to be aware that we can choose our prognostic variables and spatial resolution for completely different reasons than an NWP. And I think this is really important. Um, so I'm just gonna put up a little table here about the amount of data that goes into forecasts from ECMWS IFS, where a spherical shell of data is one variable on one at atmospheric level. Uh, ECMWF has 820 of them in their IFS. GraphCast has 227. Uh, NVIDIA's SFNO has 73. 74 are the ECMWF's AIFS. 69 for Pango Weather and seven for what I'm gonna show you here. So. Uh, I'm going to argue we, there's a lot of gap between 7 and 70 and 227, and we need to explore this and think about things a little bit more. So um, what we have here is a quick uh, rundown of a couple aspects of our model, convolutional neural nets, and we are um, using seven prognostic variables, including 500 hectopascal height, 2 meter temperature, total column water vapor, we have three prescribed fields, including the top of atmosphere incoming solar radiation that varies continuously as a function of time of day, year, and position. And we are using this Helpix mesh, which is a wonderful mesh from astronomy that we don't know enough about in atmospheric science. We should use it almost everywhere. Uh, and I'm going to show you results on a 110 kilometer uniform grid spacing, so about at one degree resolution, but this is uniform over the globe. Okay, so the first thing I want to point out is the model that we now have. Um, does a pretty nice job in short-term deterministic forecasts. It does not beat the IFS. It's about a day behind at one week forecast lead time in both RMSC and ACC. But this is a forecast of surface pressure, essentially Z5, uh, 1,000 hectopascal height, actually, and 850 temperature for a storm over the uh, a low pressure system over the central US. Not bad. Um, if we, but in contrast to many of these other models that have got a lot of press, this uh, simpler system has the ability to roll out long-term forecasts without a problem, without getting smooth, without losing significant amplitude. So here's a 1,442-step uh, simulation, which I picked instead of it even one year because it has a nice low-pressure system over the North Pacific here. If you can pick out, uh, um, there's Alaska up here and so on. And the actual uh, verification, of course, does not match at 365 days. But you can see characteristically, we have fiber hectopascal heights, which are the color contour field that are reasonable, as well as Z1000 uh, pressure contours in black that are again reasonable after a whole um, one year of simulation. So this is a model you can roll out further uh, in time than many of the current ones, and also, the other thing that's really important that I don't have a lot of time to talk about here uh, is that we can diagnose, for example, precipitation and do many of the kinds of things that are um, handed over to parameterizations in NWP surprisingly effectively. So we're at this 110 kilometer scale. We're taking those same seven variables that were listed on an earlier slide that I didn't want to take the time to actually name. And we are diagnosing precipitation from the verified data set. So of course, the R5 data set's own precipitation is somewhat suspect. It's not uh, a convection resolving model and so on. But notice that here in tropical convection over the Indian Ocean, we've got a pretty good diagnosis using data. And it's very coarse resolved. So it's not entirely clear. We even need small scales to get the convection right in the machine learning world. 
And finally, for my last slide here, uh, what I'd like to do is just point out that uh, in contrast to some of the stuff we've heard most recently, we actually sort of were with the IFS in terms of skill levels back in 2021 with our older model, not as good as the one we're talking now. We're trying about now. I'm trying to redo these simulations here, get everybody update this figure. But this is a, a graph of uh, CRPS, which is a probabilistic skill score for ensembles. Lower is better. CRPS penalizes both bad means and wide spreads. And so this is the global annual average result comparing uh, ECMWF's 51 member S2S ensemble from the IFS with uh, a grand ensemble we had of 320 members uh, in green. And, what, and then also there's persistence in pink and climatology in, in gray. So we're beating persistence in climatology as is the IFS. But the interesting thing here is that at four week and weeks five to six lead times, we're equal to them in our CRPS score. So this again is an old result. We think our new model will already do better and we're really working hard to get this expanded to a full earth system model with sea surface temperature and things like that in it. And then we're gonna redo this, but we think we're already at a point where arguably we have a close to model replacement for forecasting on the S2S time scales anyway. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and we will go to our last one. And I want to encourage people to um, keep putting questions in the chat because after our last speaker, um, we will start doing questions and answers from the chat and hands up in the air. And with that, there's Jason Furtado. Hey, thanks a lot, uh, Amy. And thank you everybody for having me today. So as Amy alluded to, um, I'm going to kind of wear two hats today. I'm going to I'm an associate professor of meteorology at the University of Oklahoma who does a lot of this S2S stuff, but today I'm going to speak a little bit more on, from the private sector side and specifically from a very specific company, um, Salient Predictions, on which I sit as a board of, uh, on their board of advisors. So there we go. Okay, so just a little bit about Salient. Uh, so Salient Predictions essentially produces S2S forecasts, um, really focusing a lot on ocean variables as the driver of their data-driven models. Um, and specifically salinity. So kind of the idea about evaporation over the ocean, driving sort of changes in the hydrologic cycle, which can change sort of atmospheric patterns, which affect precipitation, but also temperature as well. A lot of this grew out of research um, that started at Woods Hole. So there's numerous uh, peer review publications. So really started from that end first, and then a proof of concept done later um, during a subseasonal climate forecast rodeo that happened here in the US um, a few years ago. Um, and so that was really a case where we were taking that knowledge or the, they, they were taking that knowledge and applying it through, a, through a, a, a machine learning application to produce these accurate S2S forecasts for temperature and precip. Now that the company is formed, now they're producing a lot of these different forecasts, but one of the um, key things is that the production of these data-driven model forecasts are really industry specific, which gives another challenge. It's not so much of just getting out of temperature or just getting out of precipitation value or probability, but it's actually creating client customized forecasts for these different things. People in agriculture, for example, have very different outputs or needs that they want from say someone in supply chain or the financial sectors. So just a little bit about their models, again, a high, high overview view of it. Um, it's a probabilistic forecast model. It's quantile based. Um, it's been debiased and calibrated for, for reliability. Forecasts go out on the subseasonal scale starting at about week two, all the way into about week eight. And then there are also extended forecasts beyond that going out to monthly, semi-annual, and out to all the way to 52 weeks. Several um, accuracy metrics are made available, and these are made available to all of the clients both probabilistic and deterministic forms as well. There are also classification or categorical scores also provided, again, depending on the user. I also did want to point out, um, you know, the model as a data-driven model is being updated constantly. So right now um, they're on version 7.1. And this is sort of one of the nice and nice things about data-driven models is that there's a rapid way, a, a rapid cycle of experimentation for these things and a rapid way of sort of getting out sort of newer models. Um, that could also be seen as a maybe a challenge as well as new data comes in, um, but, th but that's a nice uh, facet of these data-driven um, S2S forecast models. The other thing is that 
all of these comparisons between, say, the salient model and with other uh, S2S models out there, they're all transparent. Um, they're all given as scores, and, and all of these scores are given for the models versus the salient model to see which ones are performing well at, at different times. So that's an important aspect as well um, for the end user to see exactly where, where the salient model scores compared to these other ones. Okay, so uh, a little bit getting back to those core questions, advantages and challenges of using this data-driven model. So the, a lot of the advantages of using it, there's low cost of inference to get these to, to, to get these predictions. A lot of flexible model outputs. So again, these are getting at the idea that we have to gear these forecasts to specific sectors and specific industries. Uh, the model is actually designed to have outputs that are very flexible for those different for those different industries. Uh, it's conducive for a number of things. First, for probabilistic approaches. Also, it's very nice to be used in a cloud native compute framework, which is, of course, the way that things are going nowadays, a lot of cloud computing, and also for open source packages um, to use as well. And as I mentioned, a fast update cycle. So lots of experimentation can be done rather quickly with, the, with this data-driven model. The challenges are some of the things we've talked about uh, in this panel in the previous. First is explainability. So again, getting away from this idea of machine learning as a black box and really getting into you know, why is the prediction coming out the way it is. There's also a really complex data pipeline. There's all sources of data, ocean, atmosphere, land, all different formats, all different time scales or different spatial scales. Um, there is a high cost to, to the actual training that is done. And then, um, we also, while probabilistic forecasts are, are great, there's a learning curve and there's an education that has to be done as well, even, even from certain customers. So having to sort of bridge that gap uh, is a really important part of getting these subseasonal models forecasts out to, to a use. Um, and then the last thing is that while this is great with all of our data, one of the challenges we always have with data-driven models is that extreme events are very difficult to predict because by definition, they don't occur a lot in, in the uh, data, in the, uh, excuse me, the training data. So really getting our subseasonal models uh, to really predict those extreme events is a challenge that, that is currently being undertaken by people in industry and also in academia. The last slide that I'm going to present here is sort of how I kind of see sort of all of these things together. So we've talked a lot about data-driven processes in a lot of these talks. We've talked about the physics-driven models a lot. Um, and so really what I see is really has to be a union of these two things. But then there's also what I really like about this picture. Oh, by the way, this is from a paper by um, Polario et al. in 2019. What I really like about this image is that we have that third um, then or circle here, knowledge driven. So again, this is sort of getting at the idea of the co-production and leaning and turning to our users, turning to our stakeholders to actually get their input. And also there's going to be some knowledge gained from that. There are parts of, there is experts in other areas that may not be in the atmospheric science or the forecasting community that we could then sort of in, impart into improving uh, both our physics and data-driven models. So really the, the key here is we wanna to get to this sweet spot, right? Right here in between where all three of the circles intersect. And uh, that's that's how I see the future of all of our sub-seasonal uh, forecasting models going through. So with that, I will uh, turn it back over to our moderator and uh, take any questions. So thank you. That was a great ending. I like that diagram. It was great to put you at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Think if we can get all the panelists back up. Turn your cameras back on, everybody. Who's a panelist? And then I think they will they will pin you to the screen here. While we're waiting on that, um, I have to be able to see if I can see hands. If you want to put your hand up, uh, we're doing the, this the same way that we did the last round of questions, where the vast board members get priority on the hands up, but we're still answering questions in general. So. All right, I think we got everybody. Right. And I don't see any hands up there yet. So maybe we'll take one of the questions out of the chat to get us going. Um, hold on. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I, I, I'm reading the, the chat and looking and listening to all of you. And that meant that I did not pick a question right out of there. And um, we have a hand up. Amy. Well, we have a hand up now. We'll go for that. I did, wasn't there when I started looking at the chat. Sanjeev, do you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah. So I. Yeah, I saw all, all the panelists made a very good presentation. So I'm very happy with that. My question is, um, yeah, so you, are you over-promising from the machine learning? 
So you talked about it can discover the new knowledge. Are you trying to say the chat GPT is going to discover the knowledge? Or is are you trying to say the chat GPT is bringing accessibility, uh, making that knowledge more accessible? So as a panel, do you want to consider kind of a moderating or redesigning the question that you are trying to ask from the AI that can better serve instead of over-promising to the community? Who wants to take that? I'm gonna call on one of you to take it if you're not gonna take it, come on. <laughs> can you answer, can chat GPT can give you a new knowledge or can create a new knowledge for you? If not, then how do you expect a machine learning to create a new climate science for you? I'll, I'll... Maria, Maria, I'm gonna call on you because you and I are doing a panel together at AMS on deep learning and, and so, I'm going to, I'm going to call you. <laughs> Way to put you on the spot. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> um, can chat GPT discover? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. So I, I will say, um, Amy and I have had some discussions on chat GPT and using that for um, asking questions. Um, I will say I am not relying on chat GPT to help me formulate my question, my um, experiments right now. Um, but um, the way that we're using machine learning in my group is really just to help answer questions that we have. So we go ahead and frame an experiment where we ask, for example, which or system component can be um, can provide the most skill for a certain large scale pattern over North America. And then uh, and then we go ahead and, con and continue exploring and asking new questions in that way. So I think like Kirsten mentioned earlier, she was um, sharing work that wasn't really focused so much on improving skill at the at the subseasonal lead times, but really using it in a way that we can answer new questions. So um, so we hope that there could be knowledge discovery. Of course, it's very much with a lot of human intervention since we are the ones formulating the experiments, um, but we'll see as we go ahead how things evolve. Thank you. And I see Dale has... I threw it at you. Oh, Dale had his hand up. Go, go yes. ahead, Dale. I have sure. one more so, answer. Well, I think Maria did a great job answering that. I'd just like to add one thing, which is that if we're really talking about model replacement, a lot of the kind of science we might do with model replacement is not so different than if you're using the CESM, because the CESM has a lot of opaque parameterizations and interactions in it, and you can't really figure out what's going on. So you need to use a hierarchy of models that are progressively simpler to try to understand what's going on. Potentially, we can do that with a model that's really a machine learning model all the way, we go back through a hierarchy of, of more understandable models and we get somewhere. Um, and the only thing I'd argue, the only difference between these two approaches is if the equation-based model, you can do budget studies, which usually don't close anyway, unless it's a first order quantity, but you do lose the budget study ability without the equations in a machine learning replacement model. But the thing you gain in a machine learning replacement model is back propagation, the ability to get sensitivities of the initial state with respect to all kinds of differentiable cost functions. So I think there's kind of trade-off here. And actually, I think in terms of model replacement, at least, there's no reason to believe that we're gonna be in a position to do worse science or more difficult. We're not gonna be able to understand things like we can today with the CESM. And I'm before I ask a question of my own, I'm gonna throw one more answer in there, just because it is National Academies related. There was a workshop, um, a month-ish ago, I don't know, time has all run together, um, run by the, the not by BASC, but by the um, computer science one. And they had a lot of discussions about how we can use AI to help be doing scientific discovery. And uh, the recordings from all the talks are online. And I think that might also help answer some of that questions. I gave a talk there about how we use it for meteorology, but I was the only meteorologist. So you can go find the talks. Um, okay. I want to ask one of the questions that came up in the chat. Bruce Crawford asked the question that I think is an important one, and, and that is about all these different teams that are working on um, the, these AI models. So the, his question specifically says that US and China are competing head to head in the S2S AI ML space. Can you please compare and contrast any differences in approaches, or are both teams following the same general strategy? I'm not going to throw that to anybody in specific. I'm going to let and see if you volunteer. If not, I'm going to make you come up with something. 
Anybody want to volunteer to answer that? I can start. <laughs> Go. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's not just US and China, but um, definitely the, in terms of the weather prediction, Pango weather has come out of a Chinese group, um, whereas the Graphcast and uh, Forecast Net are from US groups, ECMWF, um, which is a European organization, largely European organization, has their own machine learning model for weather prediction. And these groups are using different approaches, but still under the umbrella of machine learning, um, AI largely. And they're all showing similar skill in some things. One of the models are doing better than the others, right? Um, but I think competition is good um, in general um, from teams around the world. Um, and going forward, we'll see um, hybridization of these approaches. Some of these models are being made open source, like the one from NVIDIA um, uh, has been made open source. Um, so that will generate more research on those models, right? So making them open source is a big um, plus, I would say, for academic research and uh, progressing on this front. Thanks. Anybody else wants to say anything? Okay, we will move to hands. Um, I don't know if Dipanja, Dipanjana, I don't know, I probably pronounced that wrong and I'm sorry, but your hand is next. Yeah, I'm audible. Yes, we hear you now. Thank you, Amy. I was present in your uh, that particular uh, talk. It was great on AI and climate and weather modeling. And uh, to be very honest, that our expectation and ambitions are expanding with uh, applications of AI and ML. And so my question to all the panel, of course, I also like to pay my gratitude to all of you for. Uh, this beautiful session that uh, now that we are also uh, getting the models like future three which is uh, predicting the flood management and human up to the level of human uh, mobility so how this uh, core climate science and art science modeling and the this application oriented models like uh, where the floods are being projected uh, projected along with how the humans will mobility that is captured the behavioral science it is kind of an end to end uh, uh, approach uh, can be is being thought under the scope uh, are being uh, taken uh, by any of you Cumulus has appeared and I saw that, but Cumulus is not going to answer the question, huh? Jason, you haven't answered the question yet. I'm going to throw it to you first. I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I want to try to. I was thinking of an answer, trying to think of something as 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 the question was being asked. Um, so. If I how do can can you just can you just rephrase the question really quickly because I think I might have lost I I know it's the climate to the human um, like climate and weather to the human impact part is that sort of the yeah it is actually I was asking that if uh, this whole integration that starting from absolutely uh, core climate science modeling oh. to up to the level of uh, decision making and impact to the human mobility how the, I mean, people are migrating due to climate change. This end-to-end -end integration is possible under the gamut of uh, application of AI and ML, along with the so, climate science and uh, conventional modeling. Okay, yeah, so um, so my, my own personal philosophy on that is that I don't think, first, I don't think there's a one size fits all to this kind of thing. So there's not gonna be one application of the climate weather models to one end result for different human applications or for different end users. So again, I think that there has to be this notion that we have to have, we have to think very openly and very flexibly about how we apply our different models. 
um, not necessarily you know the you know not necessarily the core variables from the atmosphere, ocean, or land, but actually what hap or what are we getting out of the model? What do we want from the model? How are we post processing that data? I think all of that has to be very unique um, in terms of what what we're after. And so I think during the panel there was you know several examples of different applications or, or different specific um, topics that people were going after. Um, and I think that that's probably the way that we want to move forward. So it's not a one size fits all. Um, is it possible? I think for different applications, yes. But again, I don't think it's a one size fits all kind of approach to this. Maria, you want to take a short answer and then we're going to jump to another question from the chat. Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to add that um, I think there's a real opportunity for us um, here where we're seeing all the creative ways that we can use machine learning and um, and like was just mentioned where um, it's very a flexible tool. And so that gives us an opportunity to connect more with um, the humans that we're trying to serve at the end of the day. And, um, you know, rewriting the way that we're using our metrics and our loss functions and training our networks so that we're ultimately actually getting the thing that we um, are hoping to get for to deliver to a stakeholder. Um, so instead of just focusing on the skill of temperature and precipitation, for example, maybe there is some other subsequent thing that um, that human needs. And um, and we have this opportunity now to use these tools. So um, I think that's something I'm really excited about as we're moving forward. And I'm gonna use that human connection to jump us to the question that's in the chat that I really like that comes from Eleanor um, about the co-production. So connecting some of this with the co-production that we talked about in the previous session, how much Co-production is being done with data-driven S2S forecasting methods, and how do you think users respond to this AI ML versus the traditional methods? And that may be, well, that's a question for anybody who's working with end users, I think. If the answer is no one is, then that might answer the question in a way we don't want. <laughs> well, I can kind of, I can maybe go after that. So I think that this gets, so the idea about um, sort of the response really has to do with this with this idea that I talked about um, and others have about trust and sort of the black box nature. So again, it's this idea that we have this, you know, machine learning model and we put a, we shove a bunch of data in it and it comes out with these answers and they look like that they're correct, but it's much, it's, it's not just being correct. So I think that's another part we have to think about. It's not so much that the forecast is correct. It's that it's usable and it's trustworthy. So how reliable is it? And then do you know the, the workings on the inside of the box? And so I think that that's what a lot of thing, a lot of uh, different uh, areas are starting to do. Um, Kirsten talked some of it about the explainable AI stuff, but there's, um, there's a lot of other ways to make things transparent. And I think that's a huge factor, um, especially um, from you know, any kind of application um, at the private sector or even the government level, is that you have to be transparent in the metrics, transparent in the methods, et cetera. And the more transparent you are, you know, the more trust you can build in that uh, going going forward. I would say also, I, I think in the weather community, they've been looking at um, perceptions about machine learning and AI just in general and trying to understand just based on that, how people may respond to your um, specific application types of models as well. But I, I don't work in this space, but that's something I've, I've heard before. And I'll quickly add that um, something we're starting to work on here in Maryland is the idea of um, taking social science data and integrating that with our physical science data. And this isn't so much on the S2S timescale, more on the short term weather timescales, but, um, but just another example how um, much more flexible uh, or flexibility we have as a result of machine learning um, to take these different types of data sets and fuse them together and, um, and see the impact on different communities. Anish. Yeah, just quickly, another framework that's being used currently um, in Europe is the Destination Earth, which is also called um, a Digital Earth Framework within the WMO uh, framework, which is integrating our forecasting models, forecasting ability with um, users who use the data to make decisions. Right? And how do we make an end-to-end framework or machinery that produces forecasts that feeds into decision making that um, then can be used um, in societally relevant ways. Uh, so it, it'll be exciting to see what 
uh, comes out of destination or um, especially on the S2S S2 front. And there's also similar efforts in US. Uh, thanks. I'm gonna ask a final, I don't know if it's a final question. We'll get to Bruce last, but I'm gonna ask a question for everybody. Um, and it's sort of a combined question, but where you think we need investment in this to make data-driven S2S forecasting continue to proceed? And related to that, if you want to address the public-private partnership, because I think they are related, I'd love to hear that as well. And you can just go, I'll go around in the square, the order in which the squares are in my screen. So Jason's first. Of course. Um, <laughs> uh, Sorry, no. you're, you're the upper left on my screen. <laughs> That's fine, no, no worries. Um, it's, uh, yeah, so where do I see that we need to invest a little bit more? You know, I wanna go at this at a different angle. I think we need to really think about at the um, at the workforce development stage and how are we training our atmospheric scientists to enter this new realm going forward because we know I mean I think this is something that's not going you know it's only going to expand as as was discussed and it's exploding how do we train our new our new workforce I think there has to be a lot of investment in that um, and that takes money it takes people it takes a lot of different things um, and then about the public, I'll just quickly say public private sector, um, you know, I think that there needs to be more, more of those um, sort of collaborations happening a lot more than I think are happening now. And it's good to see some of it on this panel and others starting to do that, but I think it needs to be done on, on bigger scales. Dale, you are the next square on my screen. Okay. Um, so uh, I certainly agree we have to look into training the next generation. I totally think that's a a good point to to bring up. This is not going away. Indeed, we need people who are conversant with this tool, and uh, it's it's a really important thing. I also feel like an important aspect of public private partnerships is a chance to really get maybe the kind of um, maybe computer resources, but even software developing resources that are very hard to afford at a university. Some of these top programmers in some of these places that have developed GraphCast and ForecastNet and and the Huawei, Pangu, you know, these things are not, are hard, it's hard to pay those kind of people at a university. So I think it's an important aspect of public, private, um, public university cooperation to get uh, the, the companies involved and to have a real good give and take. Still open access, hopefully, but um, to have a good give and take. Anish, you are my next square. Thanks, Amy. Um, I definitely agree. I think the biggest investment should be in um, in our future in um, educating our future on this uh, front, training the next um, set of graduate students and um, so on. In terms of public private partnership, I, I think the private sector has its own um, motivations, but if uh, what it develops, if at least some of it can be made open source, that's uh, definitely a way that the academic world can engage with, with them pushing the research forward that would benefit both. Right? And the third quick point I'll make is we should not stop supporting our dynamical models, dynamical understanding and scientific um, knowledge expansion, right? And that's fundamental to generating some of these machine learning models without a uh, Without a good reanalysis, without good observations of the Earth system, without a good model, we'll not be able to um, make a good machine learning model. So we should continue with that. Thanks. Maria or Cumulus? Cumulus is uh, very engaged at this hour, apparently. Um, so I, um, I'm, I totally agree with the previous comments that were made, and I guess I'll go ahead and add something new and say if I could pick something to invest in, it would be a way to synthesize all of these rapid advances. Um, so some sort of sort of chat GPT, like a scientist GPT that can um, synthesize all of this information that is coming to us um, in, in very, very fast uh, fashion. And I mean, we're having to keep up now with um, not only our system science advances, but now also computer science advances and, um, and also thinking about societal um, implications and, uh, and of course our changing climate. So, um, so yeah, having some help um, from artificial intelligence to be able to synthesize all of these advances and, and help us come up with um, perhaps what would be like a, the most impactful um, work that we can do moving forward. And, um, and that's all. Thanks. Okay, Kirsten, you are my last score. Great. Um, I 
of course agree with everyone everything everyone said already training the workforce um, i want to second um a niche on be, continuing to support our dynamical models and making sure that they um, actually simulate our Earth system well. If we're going to train our models on data, we need to have good data. Um, so I wanted to second that. Um, secondly, I think uh, we need to focus on forecasts of opportunity. I think they're um, currently under underrepresented right now, and I think they can be very useful for, for subseasonal timescales. Um, and then more space to discuss lessons learned um, from machine learning, I often see successful applications of machine learning applied, but I think there needs to be a space for where um, where the machine learning doesn't work out and and what you learned from that and and how we can move forward based on that. So that is the addition I will add. Okay, and I um, didn't mean to ignore Brian's hand. It's been up for a very long time. That was a really good ending, but I'm going to let Brian ask the very last question. But Brian, it better be really fast because we're over time. <laughs> The last question. <laughs> um, what I was going to ask is a lot of what I hear a lot of people talking about in this space and all of you is the concept of forecast of opportunity and then also explainable AI or explainable data driven methods. And I'm just wondering uh, how, like, how much overlap do you see between those two or how distinct do you see those two concepts from each other? I can take that go one. Kirsten. Um, go Kirsten. <laughs> I definitely see them as um, com very related as we can use explainable um, machine learning to actually explore forecasts of opportunity. I think it pro machine learning provides an interesting avenue because you don't necessarily need to define like MJO or ENSO indices um, to be put into your neural network. You can give it just general fields and then have it identify forecasts of opportunity for you. And then you can use these explainable AI techniques to then explore what the neural network may think is important for um, predictability. So I definitely think there's um, tons of overlap between, between these two things. Okay, Maria, you're gonna be our final comment because then we gotta hit our break. Super quick, we have not discussed uh, the importance of causality and so ensuring that um, that the um, signals that we are uncovering are truly causal and not just correlated. That's all. Thanks. Correlation does not equal causation. That is an excellent note to end on. Thank you all. You all were awesome. Um, and I think that um, if you want to keep asking stuff, put it in the chat. But I want to give everybody a chance to stretch your legs because Zoom fatigue is real. And we'll be back in, I think, five minutes. Okay, I think we will go ahead and get started. Yeah, I'm back. I'm Brad Coleman uh, with BASC. In putting today's sessions together, we wanted to hear from practitioners to pioneers and from those in weather timescales to those working on seasonal timescales. And, and after sitting through these sessions, I think we've accomplished that in spades. Uh, really impressive discussions, fascinating participation. We appreciate it all. In this last session, this last subsession, we'll hear from four panelists who nicely cross-cut that mix. We have 45 minutes for panelists, the same format. So we'll go through the four lightning talks. A uh, couple of the panelists have some slides. And really, how do we, you know, looking at the timescale, bringing what we know from the long and, and rich history of, of weather forecasting, improving weather forecasts, making them more and more valuable, expanding the, the stakeholder investment and how do we bring that, where the lessons learned? And, and I think from the discussion today, I think there are lessons that could be learned both ways. Uh, so the questions that we presented our panelists were, what opportunities are there to leverage the strengths and of and better coordinate climate and weather communities for S2S forecasting? What are the major barriers and how could these be overcome? And how can interdisciplinary coordination be fostered and incentivized to promote shared goals. Our first presenter is Dave Novak from the Weather Prediction Center, NOAA National Weather Service. It's all yours, Dave. Okay, excellent. Uh, terrific. Just getting the slides up here. Uh, just confirming you're able to see my slides. Got it. 
Okay, wonderful. Uh, just a terrific and uh, stimulating discussion in the last uh, couple of hours here. So really appreciate that. I'm your weather guy. I, I'm, I'm weather through and through. <laughs> And uh, I also care about precipitation, uh, leading the Weather Prediction Center, we focus on precipitation forecasts. And so this figure really spoke to me. It's a figure from Bart et al. from 2016. And it highlights, again, it's not weather, it's not subseasonal, it's not climate, if you will, but there are these gray areas. It's, it's, it's a, uh, a continuum, if you will. And I really like this figure in, in sense that it highlights where we have current skill and perhaps uh, where that's just unpredictable beyond the science. If you look across the bottom here on the question, perhaps on chaos. Uh, but most importantly here is this user needs area that's in the orange. And this is really the sweet spot of where you probably could move the current skill just a little bit to the right and address numerous uh, different aspects. And some of this even, if you look on the small scale, some of this even uh, relays back into the weather time scale, right? You know, if you're, you're trying to get... Uh, and a mayor is trying to answer how hard it's going to rain in their particular city, say five, six days out. Um, so uh, I maybe it's my bias here, but I, I I like to focus on that day seven to fourteen time scale uh, because that is where there is some scale with the weather, and perhaps if we extend that, think about weather on out. Um, we can really start to really foster the cl collaboration amongst the weather and climate communities. I, I know NCAR was testing a convection allowing model going out to eight days just to see what would happen if you ran very fine resolution models uh, further out. Uh, NOAA's starting to do that as well. Um, in the weather space, we think about clustering. And uh, th th these applications are ways of, of visualizing uh, the weather may be applicable to, to longer scales as well. Um, so slide two here, you know, the other, other aspect coming to you as a weather, weather, uh, biased person, let me put it that way. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think about S2S as this time period where you have, you're talking about the frequency and intensity of weather events. And, uh, and, and so this is a nice paper, a recent paper looking at the atmospheric river problem and kind of relating this back to, you know, these wet and dry periods that Mike Anderson was talking about for California, well, you can relate that certainly to certain, uh, you know, specific individual synoptic systems. Um, and particularly the large scale flow that sets up an environment to have more and more uh, or, or set up the stage where we have these frequent synoptic scale systems coming into the, the Western United States. And they, they had a nice example here clustering that in the, in the, in the uh, upper right here. Um, so again, there may be ways to kind of couch the subseasonal problem in terms of this uh, kind of frequency and intensity of these of these uh, weather events uh, is another aspect here. And it's both. It's both weather and climate. I guess is part of the part of the point. On the integration aspect, I, NOAA has really taken this to heart. Uh, we have an Earth Systems Integration Board that's been trying to really foster collaboration across the line offices. One of the key projects is this Precipitation Prediction Grand Challenge. Uh, we talked about the biases that in these uh, different models, uh, that's one of our rallying cries is to uh, address these systematic biases through time to improve precipitation skill from hours to, to weeks to months to decades through development application of a fully uh, fully coupled Earth system prediction model. So I do think there are uh, integration activities that are ongoing and we can speak more about these, but this is a, a nice example. I think that cuts at um, both across scales. Uh, one of the hardest predictors we've we've talked about, precipitation, you'll note some of the AI fields are not yet there with precipitation. I'd be, uh, be interested in, in talking about that and thinking about that problem in the S2S timeframe. Um, and I think that, again, that collaboration can help uh, spark some of these uh, interdisciplinary discussions. And then um, uh, uh, Dave DeWitt, I think we'll speak next, but we've really been growing an operational partnership here between the Weather Prediction Center and the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, one of these kind of neat examples of seamless service across these timescales has been heat key messages. So you think about the summer we just had, these incredible heat waves. On the upper left here, we worked, uh, this was the Climate Prediction Center, June 7th, highlighting, you know, getting the word out, if you will, on this upcoming <laughs> uh, probabilities for really a historic event. In the middle here, there's kind of this handoff between climate and weather. Um, and on the right here is a weather 
graphic that includes both weather and climate information here in the lower right. Uh, so example here, we have both the weather aspects here and the climate aspects. And there's this internal collaboration that's ongoing through different various tools. So I think this is a budding area. Uh, this is particularly in that, that day seven, eight, nine, ten 10 to week two uh, timeframe here. But I think that is an area of collaboration that perhaps we could really leverage and work together as both weather and climate. So I'll stop there. Super. Thanks very much, Dave. Now going out, Noah's time scale a bit, we'll be moving on to Dave DeWitt uh, from the Climate Prediction Center. Great, and I apologize, I'm having trouble with the camera. So if you could go ahead and advance the slide, I'd appreciate it, thanks. And if you could just remind me how much time I have. I'll let you know when you have about a minute to go, yep. But total, Brad, five minutes, six minutes? Yeah, about five, yep. Okay, great. Yeah, so thanks for the opportunity to speak. I've enjoyed the talk so far. So an important point to make, which sometimes um, people might not appreciate, is that when they passed the weather bill, which I guess was around 2017, they defined weather with respect to NOAA products and services out to two years. So when we talk subseasonal to seasonal inside NOAA, that is considered weather. We all know that it has climate aspects, but just for definitional purposes. Uh, I'll say for those who might be disappointed that I'm not going to speak about systematic errors, I'm glad that Ben foot stomped it and the importance of addressing those. The only point I would make on that is that I think that we need to address systematic errors from the weather time scale out as these errors onset quickly and in order to maximize our chances to get to root cause, we need to isolate them as early as possible in their evolution. So uh, I'm gonna take a slightly different slant than you might expect in the beginning. Uh, I'm gonna caveat that by indicating upfront when I talk about programmatic aspects and this goes to the barriers question, um, I'm gonna speak about my personal opinion. It's not an agency view. And I do wanna recognize all the great work, many colleagues for many decades uh, here on the meeting and many more recent colleagues. A lot of great progress has been made in improving subseasonal seasonal prediction. I think our progress could be greater uh, and faster if we changed our funding priorities and we will be an amorphous, larger governing body, whoever that may be. So in particular, I think that while transition is great and when things are ready to transition, we should focus it on, on transition. But I also think we need a balanced funding portfolio that provides explicit funding for some higher risk, high reward research that's operationally focused, but may not result in a transition in a year or two years, or maybe even three or five years, right? But setting the seeds for important understanding to ultimately make greater progress down the line. So, um, you know, two areas where I think that's important are deep dive diagnostics and predictability studies. And I'll, I'll give a couple of quick examples of those. Um, so with respect to tying weather to climate, it's important to remember that improvements made in, in the fidelity of simulating S2S variability in the dynamical models are going to translate into improved fidelity and monitoring, modeling, excuse me, key processes in the climate change models. I think that when we're developing prediction tools, we need to focus on events that were not predicted well. And unfortunately, the last 10 years or so give a, a fairly large number of those on the S2S timescale. I look at those as science challenges. And in particular, you could look at the winners of 2014 to 2017, 2022, 2023, and then the 2017 flash drought. I think we need to recognize that over the last few years, let's call it 10 to 15, uh, and the ENSO events that you know should have been the dominant forcing, or in some, some views are the dominant forcing, have been dominated by subseasonal variability, such as the MJO and sudden stratospheric warming. And I think that there's also exciting work being done on other modes of stratospheric variability uh, that impact the S2S time scale, such as the QBO. And I'll note for the record that we're about to go into an Eastern phase of the QBO for the coming really large ENSO winter. It will be very interesting to see how the El Nino impacts play out. Uh, finally, I think that we need to focus efforts on regime transitions and how decadal variability can impact the S2S signal. Next slide. Yeah, so this is a great study that was done by Andy Hole for NIDUS. And uh, the basic theme here is that for the Northern Plains flash drought, which depending on you count, is uh, from 2017, which on set uh, in the uh, late spring into early summer, uh, $5 billion to a $10 billion disaster for crops and uh, pasture and, um, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, losing my thought here. So anyway, the bottom line is that if you look at the forecast, forecast that were uh, lead beyond seven days 
We're not able to forecast uh, the deficit in precipitation. So you start the forecast every day. This happens to be for the GEFs. Doesn't matter what system you look at. Day forecast from day one, when you look at the forecast lead, sorry, from day one, day two, day three, what you tend to find is that they forecast a precipitation deficit. That's the black curve. That's what we got. Again, this is considered a flash drought or what we now call rapid onset drought. If you go and look at the seven day forecast, even as you were deep into this drought, these forecasts all had no deficit, right? They were essentially either above normal or near normal, not recognizing the fact that the surface was already dried out. So on the weather time scale- minute, there, Brad, please. When you one, have a, one minute, you said, Brad? About a minute, yep. Okay, great. So uh, go ahead, one slide. Yeah, and so this again, will just speak to regime transition. This is coming out of the 2016-2017, um, what had been a very extended drought in uh, California and the Southwest US despite the fact that it was La Nina forcing, which favored an enhanced probability of below normal precipitation. We had a record number of atmospheric rivers that ameliorated that drought in about two months. If you look at the lead time at which leading models, doesn't matter which model you choose, were able to forecast that regime transition, about a two week lead. And um, again, a lot of stakeholders cannot use a two week lead of forecast information for such a rapid shift in uh, conditions. For instance, monitoring uh, water resources or agricultural decisions. So that's it. Thanks, Brad. Awesome. Thanks very much, Dave. Okay, moving on now, we'll have Andrew Robertson, International Research Institute, Institute Climate Group, World Weather Research Program. Andrew. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I think no slides were requested, but I did send, send along one. If you want to put that one, put that one up. Uh, just on the S2S project. So uh, I was the uh, one of the co-chairs of that that international project. And uh, as Andy Andy was saying in the, in the in the first session, really the goals of that were uh, a joint project of the World Weather and the World Climate Research Programs. So there was interest from WWRP side to push out the forecast horizons beyond two weeks. And there was increased interest uh, due to uh, from, from the climate change perspective in 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 uh, daily weather. So there was a sort of coming. Uh, there, there was a, uh, there was an interest to come together really to bring these communities together. It was a ten year project. It's just coming to a, a close at the end of this year. So I think there's many opportunities to uh, push. Uh, push that work forward what, what had been done so you know a lot of work was on the the basic science and the modeling uh, to begin with and uh, it was always had this operational bent to it or research to operations uh, service side uh, based on on the uh, br bringing in the the the, uh, the the modeling centers around the world so there are 11 operational centers and one thing that has come out of this, uh, one of the the, uh, the successes has been that that now uh, after the project there will be a WMO designation for global producing centers of of subseasonal forecasts, uh, and there will be uh, the, the WMO coordination of those in terms of a lead center as they have for seasonal forecasting. Uh, and that will actually be uh, hosted by ECMWF. So I think very good news is that uh, a, a lot of the the work on, on, on sort of foundation of S of the S2S project was around this database of uh, reforecast hindcasts from from these uh, eleven models uh, uh, being run around the world for forecasting operationally uh, and the forecast being made with them. Uh, this database will continue. Uh, ECMWF uh, will continue to to host this. So, I mean that uh, in terms of infrastructure, I think that, that's one thing that's that's that uh, I've I've heard mentioned several times. You know the the importance of that. That was something that was stressed in the 2016 report, uh, and we're fortunate that uh, uh, in in WMO and ECMWF, there's there's also a lot of push there to maintain that infrastructure. But I think from the US point of view, that that should also be uh, uh, something uh, high on the agenda to, to consider this. Because I mean, one thing that we did learn from from uh, doing this, uh, you know, looking at the skill of forecasts, 
uh, in in those in those high classes that it's uh, building multi-model ensembles, uh, calibration of forecasts is that it, it's difficult. It's more difficult for subseasonal forecasting than it is in the on the seasonal scale, just because of the complexities of that data. Uh, these are usually going out to you know uh, 45, 60 days in advance, but often the uh, reforecasts start on different days of the week, and it's difficult to build multi-model ensembles. So uh, it's important to have have a, a good uh, usable infrastructure, and then getting down to thinking about the use of such forecasts to have the tools uh, that are that that are that are really essential for translating such uh, forecasts into into products. So uh, a lot of focus was on on you know assessing skill and, and so on and so forth, and and the modeling challenges, sources of predictability. Uh, in in the first part of the project, but but one thing uh, that uh, there was more focus on in the second half, and that Linda Hyron's really beautifully highlighted, was we we ran a, a real time pilot project, uh, which was uh, involving uh, groups that were already thinking about uh, well how do you how do you translate uh, into user actionable forecasts to to stakeholders uh, in the sense of of climate services. So we had 15 or 16 of such, such projects. And one of the really the, the flagship ones of that was the Africa Swift that, that Linda talked about. But I, I think in the sense of going forward, and she, she mentioned it uh, also strongly, um, much more work is, is needed on that. She mentioned co-production as being, as being critical. And uh, there's, there's a lot more work is needed uh, working together with users to, to develop uh, usable products. So I'll just also mention, uh, yes, the, something that that uh, she also highlighted was, you know, the the need for such uh, forecasts in the global south. So if you look at where S2S forecasts have skill, uh, it's similar to the, the places where seasonal forecasts have skill. It's you know, it, the the tropics is really a a, a region of opportunity, uh, if you will. Uh, the MGO being another key driver. Okay, yeah, thanks. And uh, you know the the, the most di direct impacts and teleconnections are in the tropics. Uh, and if you think about you know what's needed now in terms of the the needs for climate change adaptation, it's adaptation in real time. It's the it's the early warning, early action where you, you can uh, use uh, forecasts on the on the S to S time scales. To, to help build resiliency. So there's a, there's a big overlap there with international development. So uh, there, are, there are many uses and for sure one should push that within domestically within the US. But I think, you know, in terms of, you know, equity, uh, very important to uh, highlight the importance of these uh, forecasts for in, in, in the developing world. And, uh, in, within the context of climate services. And I think, you know, uh, just building on this weather to climate, the, the notion that was also really built out strongly in that 2016 report was uh, the, the, the notion of seamless uh, forecasts. So that was also mentioned that, you know, users uh, don't, don't make the distinction between the different time scales and it's about decisions. And there was a beautiful graphic in that 2016 report uh, for the different sectors on and uh, need for what kind of decisions you have on different time scales that really go from the daily to the weekly, monthly, seasonal, uh, and and beyond uh, into the planning time scales uh, associated with with uh, where climate pro change projections can be used. And I think you know building out Wrap the seamlessness right and thinking about how uh, you know S to S can can connect with people working on climate change are uh, also very important. So thank you, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Andrew, very much appreciated. Okay, the last panelist uh, for this session and for the entire afternoon session is going to be Andrea Lopez-Lang from the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Andrea. Great, thanks, Brad. Let's see, I will share my screen here real quick, there we go. Okay, so I also only have one slide that I'd like to share today. Um, 
And just give you a little bit about a uh, little bit of background about myself. I'm Andrea Lopez Lang. I am currently visiting professor at the University of Wisconsin. Um, I was a co-lead, uh, and several people uh, on this call today have been on the S2S task force put together by NOAA's MAP program. Um, so I was a co-lead of that. And what I'm showing you on the screen right now is um, a summary figure for one of the special collections that was put together in the JGR uh, special collection. There were over 50 papers thinking about S2S topics and different, not only phenomena that contributed to thinking about uh, enhancing predictive skill at these longer lead times, but there were also a lot of uh, papers focused on thinking about ensemble generation or resolution, systematic biases. So there was a nice summary. And I think a lot of the topics that were mentioned, since we're thinking about this, what has been done since the 2016 uh, report, is really summarized in this figure where we're thinking about forecasts from this, uh, you know, really two week to a season time scale. Um, if you look at this map, you see a bunch of nodes that could represent the nodes in an AI model, um, but really the interconnectedness of not only physical processes in the atmosphere, but processes in the ocean, um, but also model configuration. And what's missing from this is really thinking about some of the AI uh, topics that, was meant, that were mentioned today. So in thinking about how we can bring together communities, bridging the weather community and the climate community, um, I think a lot of really good points have already been brought up. Um, I think the weather community was built really thinking about end products and user bases. So I think that the weather community has a really good foundation and information about how that was done. So that's something we can think about uh, in terms of how we can build a community uh, of practice. Um, I think from the climate perspective, side, you know, we're thinking about probabilistic forecasts and communicating uncertainty uh, to a public. So there's a lot of uh, resources out there in the weather and climate communities thinking about communication aspects of this problem. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about and that was brought up earlier in the last session by several speakers was really thinking about workforce development. Um, and I say that as a professor, uh, I say that as somebody who's training the next generation, and I think about the courses that are currently taught both at the undergrad and graduate level. Um, if you look at this, there's a lot of things here that aren't necessarily founded in undergraduate curriculum, and that's largely because most undergraduate curriculums in the U.S. that focus on atmospheric science or meteorology, I'm not thinking about the climate curriculums, I'm thinking about atmospheric science and meteorology, are really guided by um, the GS 1340 guidelines that were developed in 1995. So there's not a lot that has anything to do with thinking about AI. There's not really that much uh, content on a lot of the phenomena that had really been the focus of a lot of research attention over the last two to three decades. Um, so I think rethinking some of the, the guidelines on how our um, undergraduate curriculum is put together to really get students interested in thinking about this next big topic in atmospheric science is really thinking about subseasonal predictions, how we do the applications, and how we really do this co-production. I think that there's, because we don't really have this in our curriculum yet, there's a lot of opportunity to really do it right the first time, to think about co-production, to think about the jobs that students will have when they're thinking about subseasonal timescales. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is looking at this figure, you see a lot about specific types of variability. You see uh, in the bottom here in the gray text uh, about model development. Um, there's a lot on here. And I, it's been mentioned before that to think about all of this, it's a big data problem. Uh, it's also a big uh, expertise problem to making sure that you have understanding about all of these relationships. Um, so not only do we need capacity to be able to think about this problem, we need the funding to support that capacity building. Um, and I think that this goes from basic research funding to uh, research to operations funding. And I think it's already been mentioned by several people that to think about this uh, research to operations, you need to have that high risk, high reward ability to think about topics. Um, there's a lot there's a lot of potential here, but a lot of the sources of funding require some sort of product or outcome to exist. It's not really uh, flexible for that high risk, high reward type of uh, funding. The other thing that's been mentioned and I wanna reiterate is thinking about the academic 
partnerships with private sector, um, with other organizations that are thinking about, um, you know, subseasonal prediction and its applications, uh, really thinking about how far ahead sort of the private sector is in thinking about some of these topics versus, um, you know, various aspects of the academic or public sector. So really building these partnerships that cross traditional sectors. And the last thing that I want to mention, and I'm glad Andy's on this call, is just thinking about international collaboration. The U.S. is doing a lot. Um, you know, we had the S2S Prediction Project Task Force. Uh, that really focused on these topics. It was a, a good source of funding. Um, we were seen sort of as leading the funding in S2S, um, but now it's sort of, now that there's a transition to this uh, SAGES, this S2S for agriculture and the environment, um, you know, we need to think about how the U.S. can contribute to that and sources of funding. So I'll end there. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrea. Okay. So we're moving into the final discussion of the overall session on S2S. Uh, start queuing up your questions in either chat or by raising your hand. Uh, <clears throat> since this is, this is the last session and the meeting will be adjourned at the end of the, we have about you know, 17 minutes or so of, of discussion, uh, we, we can broaden it out. Uh, recall the motivation for BASC, uh, actually holding this is, is very much so that we can see how that landscape has changed opportunities, challenges from our initial or the last study in 2016 uh, to now. So lots of opportunity. Let's focus some on the initial topic here, weather and climate, emerging the two, and then we can continue through uh, the rest of the time. Lots of discussion. Thanks everyone for the great discussion and chat. So Neil, you're up and ready to go. Yeah, thank you. Um... Andrew, you brought this up a little bit, but are there specific equity issues tied to at sort of the S2S scale and also thinking of co-production and the public-private partnerships? And, and are there are there things that should be thought about and done ahead of time from the from the get-go to address those? I mean, I guess I was thanks very much for the question. I was thinking uh about climate injustice and how you know many of the, the, the countries that are feeling the biggest impacts and the most vulnerable to climate change are the ones who haven't contributed much to the problem. And uh, they are one, often you know, facing some of the biggest risks due to you know, ENSO, MJO, climate extremes. So uh, that as a, an equity issue, and it was one that you know, the, the IRI was founded 25 years ago, and that was, that was sort of part of the, the, the thinking when uh, of, of founding the IRI, which was funded for 15 years uh, by NOAA, uh, that there's, there's, there's new breakthroughs in ENSO prediction uh, should be you know, brought to bear to help society. So I was thinking of it in that vein. And I think you know, within S2S, there's, there's even more opportunities there uh, because you, know, you have that other big uh, S2S climate driver, the MJO, also also in the tropics. So I think there's 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 lots of opportunities for uh, developing uh, really useful uh, climate services, use S2S climate services that can help adaptation to climate change uh, in 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 the S2S realm. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Uh, and just for other speakers, other panelists, you're also welcome. Uh, to join the group here. I think I'll move to Mike Fra. Uh, thank you much for can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, so this is a kind of an open-ended question. Uh, and uh, it, maybe it's a, not just for this panel, but for previous ones. And that is the ability of the, let's say those of us in the government uh, to move quickly and maybe the lack of our ability to do so. Uh, uh, in terms of being able to bring in new capabilities. And we've seen recently the private sector move very rapidly in this space, which some of the speakers spoke with earlier. So uh, kind of an open-ended question to the panel is, uh, unlike perhaps some of the other things that we have done in the past, um, um, is this really an area that, to, that we're going to be required? To, to, in other words, a, do we really think that those of us in the government sector, the, the public sector, are going to be able to keep up or or compete with the private sector when it comes to uh, AI 
uh, predictions of it to, in this S2S space? Or is this something that we should uh, maybe be a lot more active in collaborating with uh, the, 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 the public, excuse me, the private sector? And if so, what are your ideas for doing so? Who would like to respond? Sure, I'll, I'll take a first swing at that. Yeah, no, I think you're right, Mike. I think the European Center has has led out on this. Uh, and, you know, as, as Alan Thorpe, a previous director of ECMWF, used to say, if we don't go in the right direction the first time, we'll be quick followers. I think they have formed these private partnerships. I think that the Weather Service, starting with EMC, is going to go in that direction. CPC has our toe in some of these areas, but certainly the ability of uh, these companies, as was emphasized in the previous session, to move and explore and innovate is much greater than ours. And um, CPC, we're technology agnostic. You know, if there are better tools, we want to know what those are. You have to kick the tires, though. I've, in my experience, I've seen a lot of forecast tools that did well in sample and uh, or, or for a small training period, and you got them out in real time and the boat sank pretty quick. So I I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist on AI ML, but I, I think we need to make sure we have rigorous testing procedures uh, and extended sets of reforecast and look at cases where we did not do well in the past that perhaps we classified as unpredictable, but maybe it was just limitations in our methods. Anyway, that's my response. Yeah, and if I can just add to that, I mean, as we saw in the second session, you know, there's, there's a, lot, a lot of people in academ academia are working on this. And I've seen, you know, there's just huge interest now uh, for people working in machine learning, AI, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, do inter internships or just learn about these things in, in, in application to, uh, to, to S2S. So I think, you know, uh, the, there's, there's a huge opportunity in, in academia for, uh, you know, building this out, building into to curricula. Uh, and, you know, going, you know, as, as was all, also mentioned, you know, thinking about going, going end to end, how, how can you, how can this uh, help as you get into uh, tailoring these forecasts for particular sectors? And often in those sectors, there's, there's been a, a lot of work uh, on using AI methods recently, such as in hydrology, uh, a lot of people use, using AI. So uh, there's, there's, there's low hanging fruits in, in terms of you know, connecting connecting these things, also getting down to more toward the uh, the user end. Over. Yeah, and and, and Mike, just uh, I think about some of these thorny, difficult, difficult problems that uh, we just haven't solved. And I think it was in the previous session of where can we leverage AI uh, to be have better understanding. So it goes to your point, um, Andrew, in terms of the academic sector as well that there's probably collaboration needed, private sector, academic sector, and government together. Um. You know, from the academic sector, I'll just throw in, um, there's some really interesting funding opportunities that are available um, that sort of encourage these sort of relationships mm -hmm. to grow. Uh, and the one that I'm thinking of currently is that there was recently the joint NSF NOAA IUCRC, which is the uh, industry, university collaborative research center or something along those lines but basically um there's a topic and you're encouraged to develop a relationship with multiple industries to work on a current topic of interest uh, to both nsf and NOAA. and the current call uh, was focused on thinking about um, climate risk modeling which it turns out you know like we've heard many times that industry and end users don't think about weather and climate they think about it as a continuum. So a lot of what's fallen into this space is thinking about seasonal forecasting and longer. Um, so I think that there's there's avenues that we could explore uh, as a community to think about how we can encourage these partnerships. Super. Uh, real quick, for those, again, all the earlier panelists, if you do want to join and get pinned virtually to the, the screen, raise your hand and the staff can do that for you. I want to call attention to, to Bernadette's comment, which I think is a really important one, which is we often talk about public, private, and academia, but sometimes NGOs don't get mentioned quite as often. And really, especially as we go out to these longer timescales, it would be very helpful to be very intentional about reaching out and including NGOs when and where we can. 
So next queue, next in the queue, Dipanjana. Dipanjana. Sorry. Yes, uh, okay. Again, gratitude to all the uh, panelists today. And uh, usually what we see that in the weather and climate models, uh, longer time scale forcing functions that De, uh, taken into uh, during uh, the ensemble. But as now we are again thinking about the S2S, which can have direct uh, impact on the end user. So is it now time also to take, uh, also to incorporate the forcings like uh, the rain, which is being created due to geoengineering or the volcanic eruptions, which nowadays we are observing that uh, impacting also the city climate to a great extent. I've brought up a net and casting for forcings. You go and when? Thoughts? Well, I can I can maybe start on on that one. I mean, uh, in, in terms of you know greenhouse gas forcing, then you know our, our seasonal subseasonal models use use current current concentrations that, that don't change much. But I think that uh, there's there's opportunities to in terms of cross time scale work, uh, the kinds of uh, the kinds of phenomena that that cause extreme events in in climate change projection. Uh, simulations projections uh that one can you know they're, they're the same phenomena that we have that uh, in in s2s forecasts so you know for example over pakistan the the uh the the, the big floods uh last year uh associated with with uh, monsoon depressions interseasonal oscillation related to mjo uh, we see similar things in in the projections as well toward wetter. So I think there's there's lots of opportunities there for using uh, you know S two S science to help inform the the climate change uh, science community and vice versa. So I mean I feel there's been you know in the past somewhat of a siloing uh, of of work people who work on variability and short term prediction versus people who work on climate change projection and long term change. And part of that is due to siloing in, in infrastructure. So, you know, you've got CMIP for the climate change projections. Uh, you've got uh, S2S database or, you know, sub X, sub C, uh, or, you know, NMME for, for, uh, for uh, short-term prediction. But, but uh, you know, these things don't talk to each other. And what we need is we need more seamless uh, data infrastructure too. Uh, so, I mean, infrastructure, cyber infrastructure, that's something that was called out in the NAS report from 2016. Uh, you know, we need to, uh, we, we need to, we need to have, a, I think, a much, a much more unified approach. And then also taking, you know, that's where the connections with, you know, uh, cloud storage, cloud computing, uh, data revolution, you know, Pangeo tools like that. Uh, there's, there's big opportunities there for, uh, for and it's a very very fast moving area, uh, so I think there's I think that's something where where there's there's, there's big opportunities, the challenges because uh, different infrastructures being used, but but something where where it's important to 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 have have some focus. Over. Excellent. Thanks, Andrew. David. So I don't know if, and I apologize if Linda M was on that topic. I was actually going to make a plug based on for a suggestion for a future briefing to the Basque based on some of the dialogue. Can I do that, Brad, quickly? Sure. Yeah, and that and that is so the part that Andy got into, which is the international climate services. So I've only spoken about our domestic portfolio, and of course, you know, I was at the IRI. They do a lot of great work in the international portfolio. Uh, international realm, excuse me. CPC also uh, does a lot of international work for US agency for international development, FUSENET, the Disaster Risk Reduction Department, uh, and most recently through the State Department, uh, their initiative that has started in this administration under PREPARE, which is Disaster Risk Reduction in the Developing World. There are three foci, Caribbean, 
uh, Pacific Islands and now Africa. And I think that, you know, I could probably speak more than five minutes just about the um, work that we're doing and, of course, could bring along the, the head of that particular program. So anyway, just a suggestion might be useful for another briefing about S2S for the developing world. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate that. Linda. Yes, thanks, Brad. Um, so I just want to follow up on one of uh, Andrew, Andrew Robertson's comment about having sort of a seamless prediction system across all time scales. And I think we still have to recognize that there's an important distinction um, about whether or not forecasts are verifiable within the time scale that decisions are being made. And that's one of the big distinctions going out, I think, certainly in weather forecasting, but out to um, seasonal prediction, which is quite different from longer term climate change. And I, and I think, um, you know, the other Linda, Linda Hirons and I had a brief interaction about this. Um, and I think it would be really useful to look at that issue in more detail from a stakeholder point of view, what difference does it make whether or not the prediction is verifiable within the time scale of the decisions that have to be made? And so there, I mean, that's a very important distinction. So there is not, in one sense, there is no such thing as a seamless prediction across these time scales from the point of view of the users and decision makers. Andrew? Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Linda, for making that point. That absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I'm always I absolutely agree that. with that. And I think that's the essential point, that because we do have retrospective forecasts of S2S, we can see how well they perform. We can verify them. Mm -hmm. You can't do that for climate change projections, but they're right. the same types of models that are used. So there's an opportunity there. And I think it's been proposed in a, in a paper from, from some time ago that one could even use, you know, they were talking about seasonal forecasting there as a, as a means to to calibrate the, 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 the projections because you would have you have you have a verifiable, verifiable setup. But I think your point about uh, the stakeholders, uh, that's also a really important one, too, uh, to make where you can make that distinction about, well, you know, for the, these uh, S2S timescales, we, we, we can verify, uh, and that's what you cannot do for, for climate change projections. And just so, uh, I think that's the point you're making, that, that you can yes. you, you can you can really, uh, you can help explain these things and what, what, what kinds of uncertainties you have uh, in the different types of products, and that can help inform how they, they can be used. Yeah, thank and, you. And, and, and I would supercharge that, that, that day eight to 14, is ripe for a simpler problem in that respect of the of the verifiable and, and kind of uh, thinking about that aspect. So there, maybe there is some seamless aspect in the weather to subseasonal, but to this point, maybe maybe not on the seasonal or climate change, for example. Well, I think we really don't know yet, and that is why it needs to be um, more carefully explored. Excellent. Well, we're actually right on time. Uh, and I don't see any more hands. Uh, so I think what I'll do is <clears throat> first thank everyone. What a, a great day. Uh, I can't imagine anyone having sat through this not being particularly excited and challenged and thinking through a lot of different things. Uh, not only just uh, you know the the value and impact of the s two s to s arena in in the forecasts themselves uh personally you know i had a little bit of time there with bear and doing global global agriculture it was a holy grail how could we get information and that we could really make decisions that would go it would, and it's across all sectors so this is an incredibly society incredibly valuable important problem to society and and, and then to get to sit through listening to all of the panelists and the great discussion in chat and, and the opportunities, it, you know, it's just, wow, so exciting. Uh, I love to see the, the pioneers in, in the AI arena. Uh, 
that's exciting and everyone else working so hard on it. So I think that what we'll do is we'll close it out. Um, thank you all for attending. Everyone will get a notice when the recording is done. Uh, it takes a few days to process. You'll get notice of that and you'll get a copy and be able to go back and review anything you'd like. Other than that, I, I believe we're done. Is that true, Katrina, on where you just basically thank everyone. Thanks to the Anna, the National Academy staff again and to all the panelists and all of you for hanging out for the, the day and, and participating so, so actively. So I think we're done. <laughs>